He has an ongoing program to inspect and replace old corroded structures. Since 2006, 13 of the high priority structures have been replaced or rehabilitated. The city also has a program to clear the ditches of sediment deposits that have accumulated over time and clear fallen trees and debris in the Myakahatchee Creek. This also helps restore the flow capacity of the waterways. Long story short, Northport is prone to flooding, but the city works hard to maintain conveyance channels, water control structures, and procedures put in place to lessen the impact. When there is a hurricane or a significant rain event, the city gets into response and recovery mode quickly after. Please stay safe out there.
Hello everyone, my name is Mario Venditti. I am the planner scheduler for the city of Northport Solid Waste. I got into this position, um, first I was a recycle driver for five years for the city of Northport, and then I became the planner scheduler after taking an interest in education. Okay, residents. we are ready to go. Today is Tuesday, March 26, 2024. It is 4 p.m. We are in the city chambers and I call this road and drainage district meeting to order. Uh, commissioners present are Commissioner McDowell, Commissioner Langdon, <coughs> myself, Mayor White, Vice Mayor Stokes, and uh, absent is Commissioner Emrich. We're still wishing him uh, for a speedy recovery. Uh, but there is a quorum present for this meeting. Also present are City Manager Fletcher, City Attorney Slayton, City Clerk Faust, Board Specialist Bodmer. I thought I saw the police chief in the house. I don't now. Okay, but I think I see fire. Chief Titus, yes, thank you very much. Um, and for the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to call on Terry Seal from the Moose Lodge to lead us in the pledge. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, I'm looking for an approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All right, we have an approval of the agenda made by Vice Mayor Stokes and seconded by Commissioner Langdon. Let's vote. And that passes four to zero. On to public comment. There is none. All right, consent agenda. City manager, has anyone pulled anything from the consent agenda? No, Madam Mayor. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion to approve the items. In the um, I'll make a motion, Mayor. I move to approve the items in the consent agenda as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion to approve the items in the consent agenda as presented by Commissioner Langdon and seconded by Vice Mayor Stokes, if there's nothing else, let's vote. And that passes four to zero. All right, moving on to item four, public hearings. Uh, city clerk, could you read this by title only, resolution? Resolution number 2024-R-11, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Northport, Florida, as the governing body of the Northport Road and Drainage District, amending the Northport Road and Drainage District budget for fiscal year 2023-2024 for road rehabilitation in the amount of $2,200,000, providing for findings, providing for posting, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. All right, thank you. City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On March the 5th of this year, the commission approved resolution number 2024-R-10, allowing $2.2 million to be transferred from the road reconstruction bond debt service fund to a five balance to be used for additional road rehabilitation for streets approved in the original bond. This budget amendment will allow the funds to be budgeted in the road and drainage fund for this purpose. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. All right. Do we have any questions from any? Do we have any public comment? All right. So I close this portion of the public hearing and I'm looking for a motion. Well, I'll make it. Okay. Move to adopt resolution number 2024-R-11 as presented. All right, I have a motion made by the vice mayor to adopt <coughs> resolution number 2024-R-11 as presented and that was seconded by <coughs> Commissioner McDowell. If there's nothing else, let's vote. And that passes four to zero. Moving on to general Business, discussion and possible action regarding the North and South Tamiami Trail Access Road projects. City Manager, this is your item. Um, Madam Mayor, this item was submitted by Commissioner McDowell. Okay, Commissioner McDowell. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so this 
these two projects have been in the works. Oh, uh, is there what do you think? Uh, these two projects have been in the works since 2016. And then 2019, they're broken into two segments. They're on the access roads of Tamiami Trail, the north and the south. The south one is the oldest of the two projects. Both of the projects have been completely designed and in the back of materials is the design plans for the project. The, these projects have been not fully funded. There was some money put in and then COVID hit. Money had to get reallocated. Um, I had a few citizens, businesses along the access roads reach out to me and say, hey, we've got a really real big problem with the parking. Um, and they're wondering what the city is going to possibly do or assist them with to alleviate those parking concerns. Just for everybody's information, the parking that was done right there by the library that's on the city's right away was not a city project. That was a county project that the city granted them an easement for. So the city did not expend any funds for that. We just said, yes, you can put the parking there. Um, so at this time, the, the businesses are wondering how we are going to proceed with the project plans. Um, there is money in surtax for, but it's not until 2035 to 2039, so the last third of that surtax funding. And it doesn't fully cover all of the costs. So back in 2020, um, the commission had a discussion about possibly figuring out some really ingenious ways of paying for this parking. And one of the things that was discussed, albeit a very short discussion, was possibly seeing if the businesses were amenable to helping with the costs, possibly having an assessment on their properties because they are going to get the benefit. It would only be to those businesses. They are getting the benefit because their customers would more likely patronize those businesses because parking is a lot easier and they don't have to fight with the parking. Um, and I just wanted to see what the commission thinks. I, you know, do we want to jumpstart it? Do we want to proceed? Do we want to just wait for surtax? Um, one of the things that is also in the backup materials is the legislative text from the road and drainage meeting from July 28th. And it kind of outlines some of the processes if the commission wants to start the conversation with these businesses and send a letter out saying, hey, would you be amenable to adding that assessment? Um, so we would probably have to get legal involved to see how that all looks. But before we do any of that, I wanted to bring it to you. And I do have some members of the Moose that are here. And I'm sorry, sir, I don't, the gentleman in the purple shirt, are you with the Moose also? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so. Take it away if anybody has any questions, ideas, suggestions on how we can get this jump started, or is this something we're going to just have to wait for surtax for? All right, uh, Commissioner Leiden. Um, thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of quick things. One, um, I'm very pleased that the businesses came forward and said they would be amenable to helping pay for that. Oh, because wait, wait, wait. Let me be clear. They have not weighed in on that. Oh, oh, I they, thought you said they had. No, no, no. We would have to find out if they would be amenable to it. I didn't get a flat out right. no from the few that I did speak with, but not, they. there's a process to get yep. the yes from those businesses, yep. just to be clear. Mm -hmm. Sorry Thank if you. I was not. Yeah, clear. I misunderstood you. So um, let me rephrase that. I think it's appropriate that the businesses in that area help fund the parking, um, and I, for one, would like to see staff figure that out and bring it back during budget time, because at that time, perhaps we can either take that allocation off the rolls or reduce the allocation that's there and perhaps pull it in. Um, 
I'm not comfortable waiting till 35. I mean, it's just, yeah, something needs to be done in that area way before then. So um, that's sort of what I'm thinking. I'd like staff to figure it out and uh, bring it back during budget conversations. All right, Vice Mayor. How much money are we talking about to actually complete both the north and south side? Do we know that number? The numbers that we talked about were so long ago that I wouldn't even be comfortable saying what that price tag was. I thought I remember like it being under a million, but uh, I can't recall. I remember a CI, I think it was a CIP sheet on it, but does anybody know? What the kind surtax of has $925,000 for 2035 to 2039, but it does say that it's short $1.4 million. A lot of money. So it's in excess of $2 million, but that's also figures of construction that are well over three years old. And we all know what's happened in the past three years with construction costs. I mean, my take is, I mean, there's definitely a need. Uh, there's no doubt there's a need. Uh, I mean, cars are all over the place, and with, uh, especially with Anna Marie opening up and some of the other things that are happening on both sides of 41 there, it's, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. I really don't know what to make of the idea of, of a financial collaboration I don't know that we've done it before, and it does, I mean, yeah, I mean, on the one side, from the city standpoint, that's wonderful. It helps bridge the gap and helps move this project. On the other side, it's like businesses pay their taxes as, as do, you know, the owners of these businesses who live in the city, and, you know, now they would be asked to help pay for their own parking on city property. I assume so I don't know about that one I'm kind of scratching my head a little but it is it is a budget item but boy this should not be kicked down the road I mean I've had the same businesses come to me over this past year since I got on the commission I've had numerous conversations some of these gentlemen as well as other businesses up and down this project we need to find a way to get done without having to wait five or more years or ten years it's absurd. Um, it really needs to be done. And these are some great, solid businesses that support our city and, and, and are really, you know, uh, supporters of our city. So I, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, I'd love to know, one, what it really is going to cost to do it and, and to look at whether or not there's money in this budget to do it. I mean, it's more of a budget item. But, you know, we get into the budget and then, like... There's a million other things, and it just keeps getting kicked to the curb. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. if, if we are going to make it a priority, we should make it a priority. I'd like to make it a priority. Um, so I don't know. I don't have any real answers to it. But, you know, come budget time, my take would be let's figure out a way to make this happen and not just keep kicking it down the road because it's so needed there. It really is. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I know that's necessary there. I like the idea of assessments and having this coming back during the budget process with more information on the numbers, such as what would those assessments look like? What would they be based on? Um, I have to tell you, I'm not really a big fan of shuffling surtax money for this. We have big, big, big projects in the works and um, I know that the, the businesses need this, but if it was to be paid with assessments, that would be uh, good. But this would come back, have to come back to us with more information. I remember when, and I know Commissioner McDowell remembers this, when, what was, it, what was that college that used to be in that building on Pan American? What was that college that was there? Um, USF. Okay. Because um, I know the city chipped in for some of that parking that is on the north side of... Uh, Tammy a trail there, um, oh, which so doesn't really, ago. I know. It doesn't even show up in the budget. Uh, <laughs> it was a very anymore. long time ago. <laughs> um, but I think I remember a figure of $50,000. That's how things have changed. But I'd like for this to come back with some real hard numbers, what this would look like, 
how the businesses would help to, to fund that. Um, and then we can take it from there because right now there's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, Commissioner Langdon. Yeah, Mayor, thank you. I see the Commissioner McDowell also has her light on. I was going to offer to make a motion, but it is her okay. item if, if you yeah. should like to go ahead. And and um, I, I will be happy to make a motion. Thank you for that, Commissioner Langdon. Um, you know, I'm not in favor of the taxpayers footing this 100%. It, we, have, we have to make sure that there is a benefit to all of the citizens for this. Um, and, and I do see there is a benefit, but at the same time, the greater benefit is actually to the businesses because they, they get the patrons, which are the citizens and visitors that come there. Um, and I, I totally understand that their businesses um, are growing, which is a very good thing. But I also recognize other businesses that grow, they seek larger parcels. Mm -hmm. And that can be very costly too. Um, you know, I, and this is a very big concern of mine because the, the parking in the right of way is chipping away at our drainage system. Um, you don't have to go any further than Alvaro's and you see this, this dip. And I don't know how big it is, but boy, oh boy, from the road, it looks like a mm -hmm. crater. Um, I wouldn't want to be driving my car over that or under that. Um, so I would really like to see if we can, you know, get staff to find out what the mm -hmm. actual construction yeah. cost is yeah. using today's dollars. Yep. Um, because if we don't have that answer, we really can't proceed. Also to find out and start the process of asking these area businesses if they would be amenable to doing some type of an assessment. Should it be 100% on the backs of the businesses? I don't know. Should it be split 50-50? I don't know. Is it 25 city, 75 them? I don't know. Those are questions that we are going to have to really drill down to once we find out their appetite to have some type of an assessment. Right. So, so when this comes back, will we be talking about options such as paid parking, you know, like they do at the Charlotte County charges for their beaches. You yeah. know, those little pay states, would that be something that staff would that, automatically that come back That possibly with, could like create a whole new, whole new mm -hmm. set of problems. But if you look at the 2020 um, legislative text, there was also possibility of staff kind of putting their, their experience together and coming up with maybe other options right. we're not discussing. Okay. You know, there might be other options out there that pay, mm -hmm. pay for parking. I don't know. Okay. So um, I'll make three different motions. Okay, we have public comment. Though. Oh, I apologize. Yeah. Do we have? There is none. Okay, I just assumed somebody was going. I to did move. too. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, take it away, Commissioner. Okay, so the first motion no. I'll make is to have the city manager work with staff to come back with an estimate to construct both north and south, but separate it out. So we know how much north is going to cost and how much south is going to cost. Okay. I'll I'll second that. Uh, you okay. need to it. <laughs> All right, we have a motion made by Commissioner McDowell. Uh, who's going to read that back for, for us? Oh. To direct the city manager to work with staff to come back with an estimate to construct both north and south at separate costs. Thank you, and that was seconded by uh, Vice Mayor Stokes. So if there's nothing else for that motion, let's vote. The motion number one passes four to zero. Okay, so motion number two is to have the city manager and staff facilitate the conversation uh, with the area businesses for off-street parking assessments to their business. Okay. Just to make sure it's clear. All right. We have a motion by Commissioner McDowell for staff and city manager to work with area businesses uh, regarding the assessment um, possibility. Second. And I have a second by Commissioner Langdon. 
Anything else? Um, I think I had the motion a little bit differently okay. than you restated, Mayor, if, if we could. Go ahead. To direct the city manager to work with staff to, facil to facilitate a conversation with the area businesses for off-street parking assessments to, to their business. All right. Are you still good with your second, Commissioner Langdon? Yes, I am. All right. So if there's nothing else, let's vote. And that passes four to zero. And did you say you had a third one, Commissioner McCall? Okay. Um, the fourth motion is to have the city manager uh, work with staff to come up with potential other options, including um, paid parking meters as including paid parking meters and other viable solutions to this issue. Okay. All right, we have a motion made by Commissioner McDowell. City Clerk, could you read that back? To direct the city manager to work with staff to come up with potential other options to include paid parking meters and other viable solutions to the parking issue. Seconded only for conversation purposes. Okay. Can I speak to it? Yeah, we have a second by Vice Mayor. Um, Commissioner McDowell brings up an issue that is not just specific to this particular, these particular two locations in the city. As we grow, this is an issue in a number of places, well, the way this I is see all it. We're discussing no, right now. But, but what I'm saying is that perhaps it might make sense to make this a topic for another day on a greater scale. And so while I seconded the motion, you know, I, personally, I, I'm, I'm not so sure that, that staff's time would be best suited focused on this, these, this particular ask when really I think it, it, it should be part of a larger conversation that we should have city, you know, regarding citywide type parking issues like this. So, uh, Commissioner Langdon. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up, Vice Mayor, because I've been having conversations with city manager along those same lines, um, and it's in all of our more commercial areas as we look at our. Um, rezoning proposal. We're proposing mixed use in a lot of areas. Um, there will be a need for parking. So I also would like to see a plan citywide for parking. Um, I, I don't want to put any date on it or any pressure on it, but um, I think we are going to have to tackle that from a planning point of view. So uh, I get it. I appreciate it, Mr. McDowell bringing it up because it is an issue, but not just for this, but for. Yeah. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, but because this one already has the design plans in place, I would kind of like to keep it as this project for the north and south. And if you would like to make a separate motion to give direction to city manager for citywide parking constraints, um, I would be willing to second it. But part of the problem is developers come forward and say, hey, can we get reduced parking and commission approves it? So we're, we're creating the problem too. So I, I, if, if my motion can stand as it is, I, I would be grateful um, and then create a second motion for citywide parking issues. Yes, I, I like to see this move forward. This is a very specific uh, item that been in the works, as Commissioner said, for a long time. We already have the design for it, um, and we already know what we're talking about. With other rezoning situations, we're not really sure what how that's going to look when those areas get rezoned. Um, but this one, we already know what the problem is. It's, it's there, and it's been there for uh, quite some time. So uh, it could also be considered like a pilot. Let's see. Let's get something in place for this and see how it works out. If we go forward with one of these suggestions that staff makes and we find, gee, that's not really working. Obviously, we don't want to implement it throughout the whole city if it didn't work for this little parcel. So, um, 
But I do understand that ultimately Mr. Langdon, we have you, other things. Did you already make your comment or no? I have not. Oh, okay, right. so new comments. Okay, new comments. <laughs> um, certainly with uh, my, my suggestion that we take a look at the bigger issue, it was not my intention to delay the topic on okay. the table. I think we okay. need to move forward yes. with that. Right. Um, and, and I'd be happy to make a motion about the larger parking issue. All right, Vice Mayor. That, that, you echoed my sentiments. I absolutely, on the first two motions, I'm totally supportive of moving forward as what my concern is taking staff's time to look at a myriad of other options, whether it be paid parking, a, a variety of things, but as far as is assessing or whether the, the, the businesses in that area are willing to do that, what the actual cost is. We need to move forward on it. This project's taken forever. Mm -hmm. It's not getting done. It needs to get done. But as far as looking at creative mm -hmm. ways to handle a parking issue, that's just such a bigger topic. That's that's mm -hmm. why I, I don't, I want to do service to it. And, and I'm afraid we're going to just spend time, staff's time, on a small piece and have them come back and say, gee, this should really be part of a bigger conversation. So that's the reason why I'm really not, not terribly supportive All right. of this third motion. But Commissioner McDowell? Yeah, I just want to, I want to drill down my motion to make sure that it's understood. I'm not looking at redesigning the parking. When I suggested other viable solutions, mm -hmm. it was more the financial part of it. I, I want to make yeah. sure that that's clear. I, I definitely, right. we've already paid for design. There's mm -hmm. no sense reinventing that. Right. But to look at, maybe staff has other ideas on how this could be paid for. Right, okay. So just to make sure that financial is added to that motion, I would be grateful to just drill it down if it's okay with my seconder. So do we want to make an amendment to that, or what do you want to do? If my seconder is amenable to it. It would need an amendment. An amendment? I'll make an amendment to add the add the financial solutions to um, the motion. All right, so we have an amendment made by Commissioner McDowell to add the financial uh, solution to the, the motion. Yeah, and second that. it with Vice Mayor. So let's vote on the amendment. <clears throat> and that passes four to zero. And are we good to vote on the main motion? Amended. As amended. And that passes four to zero. Okay, are we good with that? All right. Commissioner Lang, did you want to make another motion for citywide? Oh, yes. Did you want to do that? Yes. Um, I'd like to instruct city manager to work with staff to create a citywide parking plan. Um, with funding options date TBD. I'll second. Uh, Citywide parking plan. I don't like specific. Specifically for what? Like certain other areas or just, I don't understand how this would apply. If we don't know what parking areas we're talking about. Well, where there are businesses. So um, the thought would be particularly to take a look in light of our rezoning plan, to take a look um, at parking along our commercial corridors in, in mixed use corridors. Certainly we don't need parking in the middle of a neighborhood. But wherever we're going to have businesses, we should have a plan on, on how we're going to accommodate those businesses. Do you want to make an amendment? Or no, I'm just one? still really unclear what, 
how they would know that if we don't know where they're going to be. But we do know where they're going to be. If we take a look at our, we have to approve the zoning first. Right. We haven't done that yet as a body. I'm just saying a very specific example, like this is very specific where they are. We all can relate to that, but I don't understand. Well, I think part of the plan is to identify where we need that parking well, um, in light of the commercial industrial build out the, of the, the city. The way the motion's phrased is, 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 is difficult for me. I mean, I mean, we have parking requirements for yeah. all our businesses, but as a city that's growing, and rezoning, perhaps it would be worth our while for staff to look at a city strategy for public parking that would benefit primarily interaction with businesses, but also to a degree residentially and 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 more more on that vein as opposed to you know something targeted like this previous situation, you know, a, a citywide strategy. I mean, is it time for this city to look at parking garages? Is it time to look at paid parking lots? Is it time to look at like what you got in St. Armand's where you can park in any spots and, and pay to park? Um, I don't know, but that's in addition to our basic requirements for parking. I mean, we businesses need to provide parking, but, you know, let's face it, as we grow, it, it, it is an issue, and, and people have already raised the issue. You know, I have a hard time finding a spot to park. It's difficult. So, I mean, maybe that's the ideas that staff could look at it. I mean, I'm quite frankly, in an attempt to get the, I, I'm, I'm stretching this conversation a little, but we are working so hard to get this ULDC done. I would really like to see them just focus all their attention on getting that damn thing completed, right. you know. It just keeps getting pushed off and pushed off and it needs to get done. So, I mean, maybe this is a motion that should wait. I don't know. I mean, certainly a need to look at it, but the same people who have to get the ULDC done are the people who are gonna take a look at this thing. And All right, Mr. McDowell, can you shed any light on this? Yeah, um, I, after hearing the additional conversation, <laughs> I know I was the seconder, but I, I was under the impression that there were targeted areas that Commissioner Stokes and Commissioner Langdon are aware of that are unrelated to the rezoning of the city. So um, if there are no specific targeted areas, right. then I think this at this point in time is premature. Sure. And at this point, I cannot support the motion, even right. though I was the seconder. But I wanted to explain why, because mm -hmm. the conversation I thought was more targeted. Yeah. So. All right. Thanks for that. that and I can, that's where I was coming from as well, that we have park, parking problems from businesses that were established along the access road because mm -hmm. there was never really any parking other than those little tiny areas. So that's why I was floundering, like where else would we have but, that situation? But I, again, I think with the rezoning, perhaps it is premature. We should get the ULGC done. But once that is done, I understand we have requirements yeah. for parking. But as we really step back and look at that, having 25 businesses in a row with individual parking, the, the flow of that area might be better served with sort of a, a group parking area and a walkable area um, than to have each individual small business have their six or eight okay. plots. So I'm happy to withdraw the motion. It's all right, we have a second. Um, Need to take the vote. Do we need to take the vote? Okay, let's take the vote. Can we get the motion restated, please? Yes, can we do that? <laughs> the director, city manager, to work with staff to create a citywide parking plan with funding options date to be determined. Okay, so that that motion is beyond the scope of our noticed item on the agenda, and I apologize that I did not hear the nuances of the language when it was originally okay. made. Oh, uh, we do yeah, because we don't have it on the agenda to discuss. Right. The, the agenda is limited with to this, this issue one. Okay. with respect to parking on 41. So if you all do want to talk about that and explore it more, that should be a, a noticed agenda item. item. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So, do so we... what's the proper process, City Clerk? Do I withdraw my motion? Parliamentarian procedure is to vote on the motion. Okay. Amber's legal would, I assume, trump that and 
they could just withdraw their motion at that point. That's not what parliamentarian procedure does. How about we just vote on the motion? I don't think it's going to pass anyways. No, <laughs> right. it's not going to pass. <laughs> Practicality okay. prevails. All right. Let's go. <laughs> You say uh, yeah. you do or you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there we go. We've got it. Ever remember a, a four to zero no. fail? Okay. <laughs> that was a great <laughs> motion I made <laughs> for sure. Oh, it, it's, it's definitely something that needs to happen, mm -hmm. but yeah. not just at this time. All right, so the motion failed four to zero, just for the record. Okay, do we have any public comment? There is none. There is none. So without further ado, I'm going to adjourn this meeting at 4.35. on how to recycle properly. In my position, my day-to-day, -day, usually I start out by visiting the new residents that schedule garbage and recycle containers to be delivered, and I will go see them and educate them on our solid waste guidelines. More or less, I'm more focused on the recycle part of it. After that, I will drive around the city and I actually inspect recycle containers manually for contamination and then I will take calls from drivers if there's any issues with uh, repeat garbage in the recycle and I will go educate those people as well. What I love most about the city of Northport is their residents are from all over the world and I get to learn about the solid waste guidelines where they come from as well as educate them on the city of Northport solid waste guidelines and how to recycle properly. Natural Resources Department will be an in integral part for the city's growth as we want to achieve a more balanced approach of development in the future. What we really want to do is see sensible development, sustainable development, and development that is um, in line with what we ha already have here. So we want to preserve as much as we can of the uh, natural resources so there is still place for our natural species, our, our migrating birds, and all the other species that live um, and survive in our habitat. Natural systems are a big part of the ways ecosystems function. An important part for our community, our listed species, they stabilize the soil, they provide so many different benefits, including shade, limiting the heat island effect uh, within our city, providing habitat, providing shelter for these species, and just uh, also for our aesthetic enjoyment. Well, as an arborist, uh, a lot of what I do is making sure that development conforms to the tree protection code. So one thing we already have in place since April of 2022 is a tree protection code, which is quite robust in the city of Northport that was adopted by commission and the city through also a lot of community involvement. And so we're very happy to have that tree protection code. So what I, a lot of what I do is making sure that development, either residential or commercial, conforms to that code. We are such a passionate team. We come from varied backgrounds. Uh, I think between us, we have over 100 years of experience and we are every day raring to go. And you know, we know our work is cut out here and we're happy to uh, take the challenge. Through the division and community involvement, and leadership in the city. We really hope to make great strides in protecting what we have here and finding that balance with development and environmental stewardship. I am excited to be a part of this team and I'm really seeking and looking forward to the opportunities for us to be able to make a difference. As a full class, 
TRX Bootcamp is a new class for me, although I've been using TRX for many years uh, with personal training that I do or in other style classes that I've done, but an actual focus with just TRX, this is a new class for me. I love the camaraderie, I have to say, um, with all the participants. I think we have a lot of fun. <laughs> First of all, everyone gets to use the bands, the TRX bands, of course. <laughs> And being that we have five stations, so when we have overflow or more than five people, part of the people are on the band, the other people are doing floor work, and then we'll switch. So everybody gets an opportunity to be in all stations. Just come in, have fun with it, make it your own. It's not scary, it doesn't have to be intimidating at all. You're using your body weight, you're using the angles that you choose to use on the bands, and it just varies with how you're comfortable and how you're feeling when you're here. I started with Charlotte County Utilities as a meter reader in 2004. So that's kind of where I got my foot in the door. Then once I reached a point in my life where things were more stable, I decided to leave Charlotte County Utilities and I went and got my insurance license. It was very exciting doing that for a short period of time. But after a while, I started thinking about the utility. It was in my heart. At this point, I had almost 12, just two months shy of 12 years in. And so I realized during that time, my heart was in utilities. And so I started looking around again. I seen an opening here to be a CND tech. So I applied and I got in. Typically I get here at seven in the morning. I get my list of, you know, if I can get to this, this is what I need to do. And I get in my truck. If, if I need any supplies, parts, tools based off of the work I was given that morning, I'll pick that up here at our shop. And then I head out and, um, my goal for the day is just to get as much work as that was assigned to me done as possible. And sometimes that happens, and other times there's a lot of first response calls that come in. My favorite part is the uniqueness. It's um, not knowing what I'm going to be faced with every day. It could be different. It's not mundane in any way. And it's exciting when you get a call and you're you're on your way and you don't know what it is and you you have the experience and the know-how and the backing to face whatever it's going to be so i feel very confident in facing these calls and i think that's my favorite part Frank Lamas, always manager of City of Northport. Uh, here today with Mario Vendetti, planner scheduler for the City of Northport, Solid Waste Division. We're going to talk about bulk pickups today, uh, how to schedule bulk pickups, what should go out and what should not go out to the curb, where to place the items, and then what happens if you have more than what's allotted for you for the year for a bulk pickup. So, Mario, I know we call 941 240 8050, talk to our customer service reps That's correct. about how to schedule a bulk pickup. How else can we do that? You can also go on our website, northportfl.gov, click on solid waste, and fill out a bulk request form. Excellent, excellent. So, Mario, what about uh, if a person wants to place it out, what should they place out? What's the right thing? What's the wrong thing? Basically, Frank, anything that doesn't fit in the container okay. that's garbage okay. is going to go curbside. We're going to stay off driveways. What's not accepted is tires, chemicals, okay. stuff like that. You can put yard waste out. That's considered bulk. But just make sure it's separate from the garbage pile. Okay. Yard waste yeah. is a separate pickup. So what happens if I use all my uh, bulk pickups right now? Good question. Yeah. So you can have more, but you just have to pay. It's going to be sixteen fifty a cubic yard, okay. and that's length times width times height divided by 27 is one cubic yard. Any questions, of course, let us know. Give us a call, 941-240-8050. I'm the emergency manager for the city of Northport and I'm going to discuss first responders after the storm. So it may take a while for first responders to get to after the storm and that's due to a variety of reasons. One being 
we pull first responders off the roads when tropical storm force winds are sustained for their safety. That is a standard usually across the state and other states that have hurricanes as well. So we will have a backlog of calls that have come in during the storm that we will prioritize based on urgency and they'll be responding to those as well as the calls that are currently coming in if they're urgent as well. Also, the roads might be flooded, there might be debris in the roads. Our tactical first in teams will be going out right away to clear the roads of any hazards uh, so that our vehicles can get through and respond as quickly as possible. Just keep that in mind when you call after a disaster for assistance. We are coming. You are very important to us. We care about our residents and their safety, but it may just take a while for us to get to you depending on the conditions of the roads. I'm the emergency manager for the city of Northport and today we're going to discuss storm surge and flooding and how both of those affect Northport during a hurricane. So storm surge is when strong sustained winds are constantly blowing over a long period of time over the gulf and pushing water up onto shore. So when that happens there is a lot of flooding a lot in beach erosion along the beaches and the homes inland. However, the storm surge can also push water up the river. So it could push storm surge up the Mayaka River, for instance, from the Gulf. And then the water coming downstream from the river has nowhere to go. So that can cause water to back up along the rivers and cause flooding. That, along with a lot of rain that comes from these hurricanes, can also cause an increase of water flooding into the rivers and into our water management systems, causing flooding as well. Public Works does a lot of work before the storm to make sure that our water levels are as low as possible so we can handle additional storm surge and flooding in our water systems. If you want additional information about that, we have a great video about our water control structures and you can visit the Public Works website. My name is Devon Poulos. I'm the Aquatics Manager within our Parks and Recreation Department. We're here today at the Northport Aquatic Center just to talk to everyone about our Float for Life program. We recognize that nationally, unintentional drowning is the leading cause of death for children that are under the age of four. So we have an awesome program here called Float for Life. Float for Life is a program that we teach that starts with the fundamentals of floating before we actually learn swimming. This program is targeted for those children that ages six months to four, and what we want them to do is we want them to get comfortable in the water, and if they accidentally fall in the water or find themselves in a trouble situation, they can roll over their back and float. When we launched this program, uh, we were the only one in the state that was actually teaching this milestone program. So we want to give a shout out to our Northport Rotary as well, who sponsored this program here at the Aquatic Center and actually paid for a trainer to come in all the way from Nebraska where this program originates there. We practice and we go through what's called milestones here. So as soon as the kids progress through the milestones, we can continue moving on through them. And at the end of it, it's a pretty awesome program when they graduate. It's one of the final things that they do is they jump in fully clothed and they have to turn over, roll over on their back, and actually be able to scream for help at that point in time. It's just an awesome segment program that leads right into our Learn to Swim program. So that way we can make sure we're keeping our kids safe in, on, and around the water. Frank Lamas, our Always Manager. I am here today with Mario Venditti. Mario, tell people here how long you've been doing this job. I've been here five years. Five years, excellent, excellent. Yep. So, Mario, tell people what it entails, what you do. I'm a planner scheduler for the solid waste of the city. And um, I go around and I, I greet the new residents and I educate them on the recycle. 
Excellent. Sounds interesting. Very good. Yep. So, Mario, what do you find inside the recycling bins that shouldn't be there? So let's try to tell the people how to recycle right. Well, the most common thing I find, Frank, is plastic bags. Okay. So the plastic bags are not recyclable. I find them just tossed in the container or they bag the recycle with them. Right. And, and they should This is inside the blue lid container. That's right. right. Inside the blue lid containers. Correct. And yeah. they should be either taken back to the grocery store or tossed in the trash. Very good. Do you see a lot of recycling inside the containers? Uh, I do, bags? yes, oh, I come across a lot of that. Okay, we don't want to do that, so. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can always look at our website, www.northportflorida.gov slash solid waste. I'm Stacey Losio, I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport and we're going to talk about why it's important to have a go kit and what should go inside of it. It's important to have a go bag because if you wait last minute to pack, there are definitely going to be items that you're going to forget in the scramble to get everything put together. So it's important to have your documents such as IDs, insurance, paperwork, titles for your home and your vehicles and your boats just so that if your home does flood or your roof blows up, all those documents are with you and they're safe because you don't want to end up losing those and having to try to replace those later on. Also in your go bag, you should think about what medications you might need to have ahead of time. If we're under a state of emergency, you are able to refill your prescriptions ahead of time even if they're not due yet. So it's important to do that. Also in your go bags, you should have non-perishable food, flashlight, batteries, a radio that is battery powered and extra batteries. Should all power go out, we will be able to broadcast on 97.5 FM, anything, uh, any emergency information. So be sure to have your battery powered radio ready and tuned in to 97.5. I'm Stacey Losio, I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport, and I'm gonna tell you the difference between flood zones and evacuation zones, or in Sarasota County, we call them evacuation levels. So flood zones were generated by FEMA, and they're used to determine the likelihood that you will flood, and they're used to determine if you need flood insurance, if you have a mortgage on your home. Now the evacuation zones are based on storm surge data that comes from the National Hurricane Center, and they use topography as well as hurricane vulnerability for storm surge for the area. And we use those to determine who needs to evacuate during a storm. So it's important to understand that there is a difference. If you're interested in finding out what evacuation zone you are in, which we highly recommend you do, uh, you can use your search engine of choice and type in Sarasota County Know Your Level and that'll take you to the Sarasota County government website. Water in a swale, that's kind of the ditch by your house, is not flooding. Within a, after a storm event, water should be in that swale up to 72 hours after the storm. That allows the water to be filtered, to get the stuff that came off our roofs and off the road out of the water so that when it reaches the habitat, it no longer has those contaminants in it. It also provides an opportunity to slow down water so that the water doesn't go so fast that it erodes um, the roadways or any other infrastructure. So when you see water in a swale, if it's only been, you know, up to 72 hours since the last rain, that is not flooding, that is doing its job. My name is Devon Poulos, I'm the Aquatics Facilities Manager with the City of Northport and today we're going to be talking with you guys about our free swim evaluation. It's important that we do these swim evaluations so as uh, kids are registering for swim programs they get placed in the right class. What we're looking at when we're doing the swim evaluation is every swim level has what's called exit skill assessments. So what we do is we have your child get in the water and we'll go through a series of different movements. Can you go under the water? Uh, can you show us your front crawl? Can you show us back crawl? Can you show us elementary backstroke? Different strokes within there and what we're doing is we're trying to see where your child tests 
needs to before it becomes a challenge for them at that point. Once we assess that, then we'll let you know and you can go ahead and sign your child up for that appropriate level there. It's important that we have these so that way when we're teaching a level one, we don't have kids that should be potentially in a level two and a level one class because they're not learning the appropriate skills that they need at that point in time. Right now, uh, when we're in full summer operations, uh, we ask that people come between eight and 10 to do the swim evaluations, just as you can hear the water splashing in the background, slides and everything like that. But any day of the week uh, that we're open, you can come in at any point in time and ask for a swim evaluation. We always have a certified swim instructor on site that can uh, have your child take a swim assessment. I'm Stacey Alosio. I am the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport and I'm going to be talking about having an evacuation plan. It's important to have an evacuation plan ahead of time and it's very important to write it down because that way you can have it somewhere present where everybody in your family can see it and keep it fresh in their minds. And you want to also share it with people in your family or your neighbors so that they know what your plans are ahead of time and how to get a hold of you or where to look for you after a disaster. For your evacuation plans, uh, you should have multiple routes to get to the location you're planning to go to just because traffic wise, traffic on 75 might be gridlocked. There could be some very good back roads to get to where you're going. Uh, that could get you there more quickly without being stuck in traffic. When you're making an evacuation plan, we usually tell you four different things. You should stay home if you are not in a zone that's being evacuated and if your home is built to withstand the forecasted storm. If you can't stay home uh, and you evacuate, your next option should be to go to a friend or family's home that is outside of the evacuation area and is structurally sound to withstand the storm. Third option would be go to a hotel. They're much more comfortable than our evacuation centers. Fourth option would be to go to one of our evacuation centers. Sarasota County has 12 evacuation centers. Uh, those can be found on their website. Why do we flood? During significant rain events, Northport nearly always floods in certain areas of the city. This is thanks to the locally named Myakkahatchee Creek, also known as the Big Slough Watershed. The 195 square mile drainage area flows through DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota counties, then through our city to exit at Charlotte Harbor. As the city of Northport is located at the low end of the Big Slough watershed drainage system, the city's current flooding and water quality conditions are attributed not only to the city's growth, but also to upstream runoff in the DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota County portions of the Big Slough. During significant rain events, ponding can also occur. Ponding occurs in low-lying areas that are characterized by poorly drained or supersaturated soils. With back-to-back -back rainfall events, the ground is totally saturated, which increases the runoff during a storm. The city works hard to maintain its stormwater conveyance system, which is comprised of roadside swales draining into 79 miles of named waterways and 132 miles of retention ditches that interconnect with each other and with the Myakkahatchee Creek. There are 64 water control structures, of which 23 are gated water control structures, 5 are gated drop structures, 28 are fixed weir structures, and 8 are drop structures. The control elevations of these structures are designed so that water is retained in the waterways in a step-down elevation system configuration. This means the water levels in the waterway segments between structures progressively decrease in elevation from north to south and from east to west. This system configuration allows both retention of stormwater runoff for water quality treatment and storage for potable water use. In preparation for a storm, the gates are opened as needed to convey floodwaters. The city has an ongoing program to inspect and replace old corroded structures. Since 2006, 13 of the high-priority structures have been replaced or rehabilitated. 
The city also has a program to clear the ditches of sediment deposits that have accumulated over time and clear fallen trees and debris in the Mayakahatchee Creek. This also helps restore the flow capacity of the waterways. Long story short, Northport is prone to flooding, but the city works hard to maintain conveyance channels, water control structures, and procedures put in place to lessen the impact. When there is a hurricane or a significant rain event, the city gets into response and recovery mode quickly after. Please stay safe out there.
everyone. My name is Mario Venditti. I am the planner scheduler for the city of Northport Solid Waste. I got into this position, um, first I was a recycle driver for five years for the city of Northport, and then I became the planner scheduler after taking an interest in educating the residents on how to recycle properly. In my position, my day-to-day, -day, usually I start out by visiting the new residents that schedule garbage and recycle containers to be delivered and I will go see them and educate them on our solid waste guidelines. More or less, I'm more focused on the recycle part of it. After that, I will drive around the city and I actually inspect recycle containers manually for contamination. And then I will take calls from drivers if there's any issues with uh, repeat garbage in the recycle and I will go educate those people as well. What I love most about the city of Northport is their residents are from all over the world and I get to learn about the solid waste guidelines where they come from as well as educate them on the city of Northport solid waste guidelines and how to recycle properly. believe that the Natural Resources Department will be an in integral part for the city's growth as we want to achieve a more balanced approach of development in the future. What we really want to do is see sensible development, sustainable development and development that is um, in line with what we ha already have here. So we want to preserve as much as we can of the uh, natural resources so there is still place for our natural species, our, our migrating birds and all the other species that live um, and survive in our habitat. Natural systems are a big part of the ways ecosystems function. An important part for our community, our listed species, they stabilize the soil, they provide so many different benefits, including shade, limiting the heat island effect uh, within our city, providing habitat, providing shelter for these species, and just uh, also for our aesthetic enjoyment. Well, as an arborist, uh, a lot of what I do is making sure that development conforms to the tree protection code. So one thing we already have in place since April of 2022 is a tree protection code, which is quite robust in the city of Northport that was adopted by commission and the city through also a lot of community involvement. And so we're very happy to have that tree protection code. So what I, a lot of what I do is making sure that development either residential or commercial conforms to that code. We are such a passionate team. We come from varied backgrounds. Uh, I think between us we have over a hundred years of experience and we are every day raring to go and you know we know our work is cut out here and we're happy to uh, take the challenge. Through the division and community involvement and leadership in the city we really hope to make great strides in protecting what we have here and finding that balance with development and environmental stewardship. I am excited to be a part of this team and I'm really seeking and looking forward to the opportunities for us to be able to make a difference. As a full class, TRX Bootcamp is a new class for me, although I've been using TRX for many years uh, with personal training that I do or in other style classes that I've done. But an actual focus with just TRX, this is a new class for me. I love the camaraderie, I have to say, um, with all the participants. I think we have a lot of fun. <laughs> First of all, everyone gets to use the bands, the TRX bands, of course. <laughs> And being that we have five stations, so when we have overflow or more than five people, part of the people are on the band, the other people are doing floor work, and then we'll switch. So everybody gets an opportunity to be in all stations. Just come in, have fun with it, make it your own. It's not scary, it doesn't have to be intimidating at all. You're using your body weight, you're using the angles that you choose 
to use on the bands and it just varies with how you're comfortable and how you're feeling when you're here. I started with Charlotte County Utilities as a meter reader in 2004. So that's kind of where I got my foot in the door. Then once I reached a point in my life where things were more stable, I decided to leave Charlotte County Utilities and I went and got my insurance license. It was very exciting doing that for a short period of time. But after a while, I started thinking about the utility. It was in my heart. At this point, I had almost 12, just two months shy of 12 years in. And so I realized during that time, my heart was in utilities. And so I started looking around again. I seen an opening here to be a CND tech. So I applied and I got in. Typically I get here at seven in the morning. I get my list of, you know, if I can get to this, this is what I need to do. And I get in my truck. If, if I need any supplies, parts, tools based off of the work I was given that morning, I'll pick that up here at our shop. And then I head out and, um, my goal for the day is just to get as much work as that was assigned to me done as possible. And sometimes that happens, and other times there's a lot of first response calls that come in. My favorite part is the uniqueness. It's um, not knowing what I'm going to be faced with every day. It could be different. It's not mundane in any way. And it's exciting when you get a call and you're you're on your way and you don't know what it is and you you have the experience and the know-how and the backing to face whatever it's going to be so i feel very confident in facing these calls and i think that's my favorite part Frank Lamas, always manager, City of Northport. Uh, here today with Mario Vendetti, planner scheduler for the City of Northport, Solid Waste Division. We're going to talk about bulk pickups today, uh, how to schedule bulk pickups, what should go out and what should not go out to the curb, where to place the items, and then what happens if you have more than what's allotted for you for the year for a bulk pickup. So, Mario, I know we call 941 240 8050, talk to our customer service reps That's correct. about how to schedule a bulk pickup. How else can we do that? You can also go on our website, northportfl.gov, click on solid waste, and fill out a bulk request form. Excellent, excellent. So, Mario, what about uh, if a person wants to place it out, what should they place out? What's the right thing? What's the wrong thing? Basically, Frank, anything that doesn't fit in the container okay. that's garbage okay. is going to go curbside. We're going to stay off driveways. What's not accepted is tires, chemicals, okay. stuff like that. Sure. You can put yard waste out. That's considered bulk. But just make sure it's separate from the garbage pile. Okay. Yard waste yeah. is a separate pickup. So what happens if I use all my uh, bulk pickups right Good question. Yeah. So you can have more, but you just have to pay. It's going to be sixteen fifty a cubic yard, okay. and that's length times width times height divided by 27 is one cubic yard. Any questions, of course, let us know. Give us a call, 941-240-8050. Stacey Losio, I'm the emergency manager for the city of Northport, and I'm going to discuss first responders after the storm. So it may take a while for first responders to get to after the storm, and that's due to a variety of reasons. One being, we pull first responders off the roads when tropical storm force winds are sustained for their safety. That is a standard usually across the state and other states that have hurricanes as well. So we will have a backlog of calls that have come in during the storm that we will prioritize based on urgency and they'll be responding to those, as well as the calls that are currently coming in if they're urgent as well. Also, the roads might be flooded, there might be debris in the roads. Our tactical first in teams will be going out right away to clear the roads of any hazards uh, so that our vehicles can get through and respond as quickly as possible. Just keep that in mind when you call after a disaster for assistance, we are coming. You are very important to us. We care about our residents and their safety, but it may just take a while for us to get to you depending on the conditions of the roads. I'm 
Stacey Losio. I'm the Emergency Manager for the City of Northport, and today we're going to discuss storm surge and flooding and how both of those affect Northport during a hurricane. So storm surge is when strong sustained winds are constantly blowing over a long period of time over the Gulf and pushing water up um, to shore. So when that happens, there is a lot of flooding, a lot in beach erosion along the beaches and the homes inland. However, the storm surge can also push water up the river. So it could push storm surge up the Mayaka River, for instance, from the Gulf. And then the water coming downstream from the river has nowhere to go. So that can cause water to back up along the rivers and cause flooding. That, along with a lot of rain that comes from these hurricanes, can also cause an increase of water flooding into the rivers and into our water management systems, causing flooding as well. Public Works does a lot of work before the storm to make sure that our water levels are as low as possible so we can handle additional storm surge and flooding in our water systems. If you want additional information about that, we have a great video about our water control structures and you can visit the Public Works website. Hello everyone, my name is Devon Poulos. I'm the Aquatics Manager within our Parks and Recreation Department. We're here today at the Northport Aquatic Center just to talk to everyone about our Float for Life program. We recognize that nationally, unintentional drowning is the leading cause of death for children that are under the age of four. So we have an awesome program here called Float for Life. Float for Life is a program that we teach that starts with the fundamentals of floating before we actually learn swimming. This program is targeted for those children that ages six months to four, and what we want them to do is we want them to get comfortable in the water, and if they accidentally fall in the water or find themselves in a trouble situation, they can roll over their back and float. When we launched this program, uh, we were the only one in the state that was actually teaching this milestone program. So we want to give a shout out to our Northport Rotary as well, who sponsored this program here at the Aquatic Center and actually paid for a trainer to come in all the way from Nebraska where this program originates there. We practice and we go through what's called milestones here. So as soon as the kids progress through the milestones, we can continue moving on through them. And at the end of it, it's a pretty awesome program when they graduate. It's one of the final things that they do is they jump in fully clothed and they have to turn over, roll over on their back, and actually be able to scream for help at that point in time. It's just an awesome segment program that leads right into our Learn to Swim program. So that way we can make sure we're keeping our kids safe in, on, and around the water. Frank Lamas, Always Manager. I am here today with Mario Venditti. Mario, tell people here how long you've been doing this job. I've been here five years. Five years, excellent, excellent. Yep. So, Mario, tell people what it entails, what you do. I'm a planner scheduler for the solid waste of the city. And um, I go around and I, I greet the new residents and I educate them on the recycle. Excellent, sounds interesting, very good. Yep. So Mario, what do you find inside the recycling bins that shouldn't be there? So let's try to tell the people how to recycle right. Well, the most common thing I find, Frank, is plastic bags. Okay. So the plastic bags are not recyclable. I find them just tossed in the container or they bag the recycle with them. Right, and, and they should this is inside the blue lid container. That's right, right inside the blue lid right. containers. Correct. And they should be either taken back to the grocery store or tossed in the trash. Very good. Do you see a lot of recycling inside the containers? Uh, I do, bags? yes, oh. I come across a lot of that. Okay, we don't wanna do that, so. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can always look at our website, www.northportflorida.gov slash solid waste. I'm Stacey Losio. I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport, and we're going to talk about why it's important to have a go kit and what should go inside of it. It's important to have a go bag because if you wait last minute to pack, there are definitely going to be items that you're going to forget in the scramble to get everything put together. So it's important to have 
your documents such as IDs, insurance, paperwork, titles for your home and your vehicles and your boats, just so that if your home does flood or your roof blows off, all those documents are with you and they're safe because you don't want to end up losing those and having to try to replace those later on. Also in your go bag, you should think about what medications you might need to have ahead of time. If we're under a state of emergency, you are able to refill your prescriptions ahead of time, even if they're not due yet. So it's important to do that. Also in your go bags, you should have non-perishable food, flashlight, batteries, a radio that is battery powered and extra batteries. Should all power go out, we will be able to broadcast on 97.5 FM, anything, uh, any emergency information. So be sure to have your battery powered radio ready and tuned in to 97.5. I'm Stacey Losio, I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport, and I'm gonna tell you the difference between flood zones and evacuation zones, or in Sarasota County, we call them evacuation levels. So flood zones were generated by FEMA, and they're used to determine the likelihood that you will flood, and they're used to determine if you need flood insurance, if you have a mortgage on your home. Now the evacuation zones are based on storm surge data that comes from the National Hurricane Center, and they use topography as well as hurricane vulnerability for storm surge for the area. And we use those to determine who needs to evacuate during a storm. So it's important to understand that there is a difference. If you're interested in finding out what evacuation zone you are in, which we highly recommend you do, uh, you can use your search engine of choice and type in Sarasota County Know Your Level and that'll take you to the Sarasota County government website. Water in a swale, that's kind of the ditch by your house, is not flooding. Within a, After a storm event, water should be in that swale up to 72 hours after the storm. That allows the water to be filtered, to get the stuff that came off our roofs and off the road out of the water so that when it reaches the habitat, it no longer has those contaminants in it. It also provides an opportunity to slow down water so that the water doesn't go so fast that it erodes um, the roadways or any other infrastructure. So when you see water in a swale, if it's only been, you know, up to 72 hours since the last rain, that is not flooding, that is doing its job. Hello, my name is Devon Poulos. I'm the Aquatics Facilities Manager with the City of Northport. And today we're going to be talking with you guys about our free swim evaluation. It's important that we do these swim evaluations so as uh, kids are registering for swim programs, they get placed in the right class. What we're looking at when we're doing the swim evaluation is every swim level has what's called exit skill assessments. So what we do is we have your child get in the water and we'll go through a series of different movements. Can you go under the water? Uh, can you show us your front crawl? Can you show us back crawl? Can you show us elementary backstroke? Different strokes within there and what we're doing is we're trying to see where your child tests to before it becomes a challenge for them at that point. Once we assess that then we'll let you know and you can go ahead and sign your child up for that appropriate level there. It's important that we have these so that way when we're teaching a level one we don't have kids that should be potentially in a level two and a level one class because they're not learning the appropriate skills that they need at that point in time. Right now, uh, when we're in full summer operations, uh, we ask that people come between eight and 10 to do the swim evaluations, just as you can hear the water splashing in the background, slides and everything like that. But any day of the week uh, that we're open, you can come in at any point in time and ask for a swim evaluation. We always have a certified swim instructor on site that can uh, have your child take a swim assessment.
I'm Stacy Losio. I am the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport, and I'm going to be talking about having an evacuation plan. It's important to have an evacuation plan ahead of time, and it's very important to write it down because that way you can have it somewhere present where everybody in your family can see it and keep it fresh in their minds. And you want to also share it with people in your family or your neighbors so that they know what your plans are ahead of time and how to get a hold of you or where to look for you after a disaster. For your evacuation plans, uh, you should have multiple routes to get to the location you're planning to go to just because traffic-wise, traffic on 75 might be gridlocked. There could be some very good back roads to get to where you're going. Uh, that could get you there more quickly without being stuck in traffic. When you're making an evacuation plan, we usually tell you four different things. You should stay home if you are not in a zone that's being evacuated and if your home is built to withstand the forecasted storm. If you can't stay home uh, and you evacuate, your next option should be to go to a friend or family's home that is outside of the evacuation area and is structurally sound to withstand the storm. Third option would be go to a hotel. They're much more comfortable than our evacuation centers. Fourth option would be to go to one of our evacuation centers. Sarasota County has 12 evacuation centers. Uh, those can be found on their website. Why do we flood? During significant rain events, Northport nearly always floods in certain areas of the city. This is thanks to the locally named Myakkahatchee Creek, also known as the Big Slough Watershed. The 195 square mile drainage area flows through DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota counties, then through our city to exit at Charlotte Harbor. As the city of Northport is located at the low end of the Big Slough watershed drainage system, the city's current flooding and water quality conditions are attributed not only to the city's growth, but also to upstream runoff in the DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota County portions of the Big Slough. During significant rain events, ponding can also occur. Ponding occurs in low-lying areas that are characterized by poorly drained or supersaturated soils. With back-to-back -back rainfall events, the ground is totally saturated, which increases the runoff during a storm. The city works hard to maintain its stormwater conveyance system, which is comprised of roadside swales draining into 79 miles of named waterways and 132 miles of retention ditches that interconnect with each other and with the Myakkahatchee Creek. There are 64 water control structures, of which 23 are gated water control structures, 5 are gated drop structures, 28 are fixed weir structures, and 8 are drop structures. The control elevations of these structures are designed so that water is retained in the waterways in a step-down elevation system configuration. This means the water levels in the waterway segments between structures progressively decrease in elevation from north to south and from east to west. This system configuration allows both retention of stormwater runoff for water quality treatment and storage for potable water use. In preparation for a storm, the gates are opened as needed to convey floodwaters. The city has an ongoing program to inspect and replace old corroded structures. Since 2006, 13 of the high-priority structures have been replaced or rehabilitated. The city also has a program to clear the ditches of sediment deposits that have accumulated over time and clear fallen trees and debris in the Myakkahatchee Creek. This also helps restore the flow capacity of the waterways. Long story short, Northport is prone to flooding, but the city works hard to maintain conveyance channels, water control structures, and procedures put in place to lessen the impact. When there is a hurricane or significant rain event, the city gets into response and recovery mode quickly after. Please stay safe out there.
Hello everyone, my name is Mario Venditti. I am the planner scheduler for the city of Northport Solid Waste. I got into this position, um, first I was a recycle driver for five years for the city of Northport, and then I became the planner scheduler after taking an interest in educating the residents on how to recycle properly. In my position, my day-to-day, -day, usually I start out by visiting the new residents that schedule garbage and recycle containers to be delivered, and I will go see them and educate them on our solid waste guidelines. More or less, I'm more focused on the recycle part of it. After that, I will drive around the city and I actually inspect recycle containers manually for contamination. And then I will take calls from drivers if there's any issues with uh, repeat garbage in the recycle and I will go educate those people as well. What I love most about the city of Northport is there are residents are from all over the world and I get to learn about the solid waste guidelines where they come from, as well as educate them on the city of Northport solid waste guidelines and how to recycle properly.
believe that the Natural Resources Department will be an in integral part for the city's growth as we want to achieve a more balanced approach of development in the future. What we really want to do is see sensible development, sustainable development, and development that is um, in line with what we ha already have here. So we want to preserve as much as we can of the uh, natural resources. So there is still place for our natural species, our, our migrating birds, and all the other species that live um, and survive in our habitat. Natural systems, are a big part of the ways ecosystems function. An important part for our community, our listed species, they stabilize the soil, they provide so many different benefits, including shade, limiting the heat island effect uh, within our city, providing habitat, providing shelter for these species, and just uh, also for our aesthetic enjoyment. Well, as an arborist, uh, a lot of what I do is making sure that development conforms to the tree protection code. So one thing we already have in place since April of 2022 is a tree protection code, which is quite robust in the city of Northport that was adopted by commission and the city through also a lot of community involvement. And so we're very happy to have that tree protection code. So what I, a lot of what I do is making sure that development either residential or commercial conforms to that code. We are such a passionate team. We come from varied backgrounds. Uh, I think between us, we have over 100 years of experience and we are every day raring to go. And, you know, we know our work is cut out here and we're happy to uh, take the challenge. Through the division and community involvement and leadership in the city, we really hope to make great strides in protecting what we have here and finding that balance with development and environmental stewardship. I am excited to be a part of this team and I'm really seeking and looking forward to the opportunities for us to be able to make a difference. As a full class TRX bootcamp is a new class for me, although I've been using TRX for many years uh, with personal training that I do or in other style classes that I've done, but an actual focus with just TRX, this is a new class for me. I love the camaraderie, I have to say, um, with all the participants. I think we have a lot of fun. <laughs> First of all, everyone gets to use the bands, the TRX bands, of course. <laughs> And being that we have five stations, so when we have overflow or more than five people, part of the people are on the band, the other people are doing floor work, and then we'll switch. So everybody gets an opportunity to be in all stations. Just come in, have fun with it, make it your own. It's not scary, it doesn't have to be intimidating at all. You're using your body weight, you're using the angles that you choose to use on the bands, and it just varies with how you're comfortable and how you're feeling when you're here. with Charlotte County Utilities as a meter reader in 2004. So that's kind of where I got my foot in the door. Then once I reached a point in my life where things were more stable, I decided to leave Charlotte County Utilities and I went and got my insurance license. It was very exciting doing that for a short period of time. But after a while, I started thinking about the utility. It was in my heart. At this point, I had almost 12, just two months shy of 12 years in. And so I realized during that time, my heart was in utilities. And so I started looking around again. I seen an opening here to be a CND tech. So I applied and I got in. Typically I get here at seven in the morning. I get my list of, you know, if I can get to this, this is what I need to do. And I get in my truck. If, if I need any supplies, parts, tools based off of the work I was given that morning, I'll pick that up here at our shop. And then I head out and um, 
My goal for the day is just to get as much work as that was assigned to me done as possible. And sometimes that happens, and other times there's a lot of first response calls that come in. My favorite part is the uniqueness. It's um, not knowing what I'm going to be faced with every day. It could be different. It's not mundane in any way. And it's exciting when you get a call and you're, you're on your way and you don't know what it is and you, you have the experience and the know-how and the backing to face whatever it's going to be. So I feel very confident in facing these calls and I think that's my favorite part. Frank Lamas always manager of City of Northport. Uh, here today with Mario Vendetti, planner scheduled for the City of Northport, Solid Waste Division. We're going to talk about bulk pickups today, uh, how to schedule bulk pickups, what should go out and what should not go out to the curb, where to place the items, and then what happens if you have more than what's allotted for you for the year for a bulk pickup. So Mario, I know we call 941-240-8050, talk to our customer service reps That's correct. about how to schedule a bulk pickup. How else can we do that? You can also go on our website, northportfl.gov, click on solid waste, and fill out a bulk request form. Excellent, excellent. So Mario, what about uh, if a person wants to place it out, what should they place out? What's the right thing, what's the wrong thing? Basically, Frank, anything that doesn't fit in the container that's garbage okay. is going to go curbside we're going to stay off driveways what's not accepted is tires chemicals okay. stuff like that sure. you can put yard waste out that's considered bulk but just make sure it's separate from the garbage pile okay. yard waste right. is a separate pickup so what happens if i use all my uh, bulk pickups right good question yeah. so you can have more but you just have to pay it's going to be 1650 a cubic yard okay. and that's length times width times height divided by 27 is one cubic yard any questions of course let us know give us a call 941-240-8050 Stacey Losio, I'm the emergency manager for the city of Northport, and I'm going to discuss first responders after the storm. So it may take a while for first responders to get to after the storm, and that's due to a variety of reasons. One being, we pull first responders off the roads when tropical storm force winds are sustained for their safety. That is a standard usually across the state and other states that have hurricanes as well. So we will have a backlog of calls that have come in during the storm that we will prioritize based on urgency and they'll be responding to those, as well as the calls that are currently coming in if they're urgent as well. Also, the roads might be flooded, there might be debris in the roads. Our tactical first in teams will be going out right away to clear the roads of any hazards uh, so that our vehicles can get through and respond as quickly as possible. Just keep that in mind when you call after a disaster for assistance, we are coming. You are very important to us. We care about our residents and their safety, but it may just take a while for us to get to you depending on the conditions of the roads. I'm the emergency manager for the city of Northport and today we're going to discuss storm surge and flooding and how both of those affect Northport during a hurricane. So storm surge is when strong sustained winds are constantly blowing over a long period of time over the gulf and pushing water up onto shore. So when that happens there is a lot of flooding a lot in beach erosion along the beaches and the homes inland. However, the storm surge can also push water up the river. So it could push storm surge up the Mayaka River, for instance, from the Gulf. And then the water coming downstream from the river has nowhere to go. So that can cause water to back up along the rivers and cause flooding. That, along with a lot of rain that comes from these hurricanes, can also cause an increase of water flooding into the rivers and into our water management systems, causing flooding as well. Public Works does a lot of work before the storm to make sure that our water levels are as low as possible so we can handle additional storm surge and flooding in our water systems. If you want additional information about that, we have a great video about our water control structure. Hello 
Hello everyone, my name is Devon Poulis. I'm the Aquatics Manager within our Parks and Recreation Department. We're here today at the Northport Aquatic Center just to talk to everyone about our Float for Life program. We recognize that nationally, unintentional drowning is the leading cause of death for children that are under the age of four. So we have an awesome program here called Float for Life. Float for Life is a program that we teach that starts with the fundamentals of floating before we actually learn swimming. This program is targeted for those children that ages six months to four, and what we want them to do is we want them to get comfortable in the water, and if they accidentally fall in the water or find themselves in a trouble situation, they can roll over their back and float. When we launched this program, uh, we were the only one in the state that was actually teaching this milestone program. So we want to give a shout out to our Northport Rotary as well, who sponsored this program here at the Aquatic Center and actually paid for a trainer to come in all the way from Nebraska where this program originates there. We practice and we go through what's called milestones here. So as soon as the kids progress through the milestones, we can continue moving on through them. And at the end of it, it's a pretty awesome program when they graduate. It's one of the final things that they do is they jump in fully clothed and they have to turn over, roll over on their back, and actually be able to scream for help at that point in time. It's just an awesome segment program that leads right into our Learn to Swim program. So that way we can make sure we're keeping our kids safe in, on, and around the water. Frank Lamas, our Always Manager. I am here today with Mario Venditti. Mario, tell people here how long you've been doing this job. I've been here five years. Five years, excellent, excellent. Yep. So, Mario, tell people what it entails, what you do. I'm a planner scheduler for the Solid Waste of the City, and um, I go around and I, I greet the new residents and I educate them on the recycle. Excellent, sounds interesting, very good. Yep. So Mario, what do you find inside the recycling bins that shouldn't be there? So let's try to tell the people how to recycle right. Well, the most common thing I find, Frank, is plastic bags. Okay. So the plastic bags are not recyclable. I find them just tossed in the container or they bag the recycle with them. Right, and, and they shouldn't. this is inside the blue lid container. That's right? right, inside the blue lid containers. Correct. And they should be either taken back to the grocery store or tossed in the trash. Very good. Do you see a lot of recycling inside the containers? Uh, I do, bags? yes, oh, I come right. across a lot of that. Okay, we don't want to do that, so. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can always look at our website, www.northportflorida.gov slash solid waste. I'm Stacey Losio, I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport and we're going to talk about why it's important to have a go kit and what should go inside of it. It's important to have a go bag because if you wait last minute to pack, there are definitely going to be items that you're going to forget in the scramble to get everything put together. So it's important to have your documents such as IDs, insurance, paperwork, titles for your home and your vehicles and your boats just so that if your home does flood or your roof blows off all those documents are with you and they're safe because you don't want to end up losing those and having to try to replace those later on. Also in your go bag you should think about what medications you might need to have ahead of time if we're under a state of emergency you are able to refill your prescriptions ahead of time even if they're not due yet so it's important to do that. Also in your go bags, you should have non-perishable food, flashlight, batteries, a radio that is battery powered and extra batteries. Should all power go out, we will be able to broadcast on 97.5 FM, anything, uh, any emergency information. So be sure to have your battery powered radio ready and tuned in to 97.5. I'm Stacey Losio, I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport, and I'm gonna tell you the difference between flood zones and evacuation zones, or in Sarasota County, we call them evacuation levels. So flood zones were generated by FEMA, and they're used to determine the likelihood that you will flood, and they're used to determine if you need flood insurance, if you have a mortgage on your home. Now the evacuation zones are based on storm surge data that comes from the National Hurricane Center, and they use topography as well as hurricane vulnerability for storm surge for the area. 
and we use those to determine who needs to evacuate during a storm. So it's important to understand that there is a difference. If you're interested in finding out what evacuation zone you are in, which we highly recommend you do, uh, you can use your search engine of choice and type in Sarasota County Know Your Level and that'll take you to the Sarasota County government website. Water in a swale, that's kind of the ditch by your house, is not flooding. Within a, after a storm event, water should be in that swale up to 72 hours after the storm. That allows the water to be filtered, to get the stuff that came off our roofs and off the road out of the water so that when it reaches the habitat, it no longer has those contaminants in it. It also provides an opportunity to slow down water so that the water doesn't go so fast that it erodes um, the roadways or any other infrastructure. So when you see water in a swale, if it's only been, you know, up to 72 hours since the last rain, that is not flooding, that is doing its job. My name is Devon Poulos, I'm the Aquatics Facilities Manager with the City of Northport and today we're going to be talking with you guys about our free swim evaluation. It's important that we do these swim evaluations so as uh, kids are registering for swim programs they get placed in the right class. What we're looking at when we're doing the swim evaluation is every swim level has what's called exit skill assessments. So what we do is we have the child into the water and we'll go through a series of different movements. Can you go under the water? Uh, can you show us your front crawl? Can you show us back crawl? Can you show us about nine minutes. You know, different strokes with in there and what we're doing is we're trying to see where your child tests to before it becomes a challenge for them at that point. Once we assess that, then we'll let you know and you can go ahead and sign your child up for that appropriate level there. It's important that we have these so that way when we're teaching a level one, we don't have kids that should be potentially in a level two in a level one class because they're not learning the appropriate skills that they need at that point in time. Right now, uh, when we're in full summer operations, uh, we ask that people come between eight and 10 to do the swim evaluations just as you can hear the water splashing in the background, slides and everything like that. But any day of the week uh, that we're open, you can come in at any point in time and ask for a swim evaluation. We always have a certified swim instructor on site that can uh, have your child take a swim assessment. I hope you I'm Stacey Alicio. I am the emergency management coordinator for the city of Norfolk, and I'm going to be talking about having an evacuation plan. It's important to have an evacuation plan ahead of time, and it's very important to write it down because that way we can have it somewhere present where everybody in your family can see it and keep it fresh in their minds. And you want to also share it with people in your family or your neighbors so that they know what your plans are ahead of time and how to get a hold of you or where to look for you after a disaster. For your evacuation plans, uh, you should have multiple routes to get to the location you're planning to go to just because traffic-wise, traffic on 75 might be gridlocked. There could be some very good back roads to get to where you're going uh, that could get you there more quickly without being stuck for a call traffic. Back when you're making an evacuation plan, I'm usually get tell you four different things. You should stay home if you are not in a zone that's being evacuated and if your home is built to withstand the forecasted storm. If you can't stay home uh, and you evacuate, your next option should be to go to a friend or family's home that is outside the evacuation area and is structurally sound to withstand the storm. Third option would be go to a hotel. They're much more comfortable than our evacuation centers. Fourth option would be to go to a more evacuation center. Sarasota County has 12 evacuation centers. We've been moving like the last Really? Why do we flood? 
During significant rain events, North Park nearly always floods in certain areas of the city. This is thanks to the locally named Mayakahashi Creek, also known as the Big Slough Watershed. The 195-square-mile drainage area flows through DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota counties, then through our city to exit at Charlotte Harbor. As the city of Northport is located at the low end of the Big Slough Watershed drainage system, the city's current flooding and water quality conditions are attributed not only to the city's growth, but also to upstream runoff in the DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota County portions of the Big Slough. We did a medical exam. During significant rain events, ponding can also occur. Ponding occurs in low-lying areas that are characterized by poorly drained or supersaturated soils. With back-to-back rainfall events, the ground is totally saturated, which increases the runoff during a storm. The city works hard to maintain its stormwater conveyance system, which is comprised of roadside swales draining into 79 miles of named waterways and 132 miles of retention ditches that interconnect with each other and with the Wyakahatchee Creek. There are 64 water control structures, of which 23 are gated water control structures, Five are gated drop structures, 28 are fixed weir structures, and eight are drop structures. The control elevations of these structures are designed so that water is retained in the waterways in a step-down elevation system configuration. This means the water levels in the waterway segments between structures progressively decrease in elevation from north to south and from east to west. This system configuration allows both retention of stormwater runoff for water quality treatment and storage for potable water use. In preparation for a storm, the gates are opened as needed to convey floodwaters. The city has an ongoing program to inspect and replace old corroded structures. Since 2006, 13 of the high priority structures have been replaced or rehabilitated. The city also has a program to clear the ditches of sediment deposits that have accumulated over time and clear fallen trees and debris in the Mayakahatchee Creek. This also helps restore the flow capacity of the waterways. Long story short, Northport is prone to flooding, but the city works hard to maintain conveyance channels, water control structures, and procedures put in place to lessen the impact. When there is a hurricane or significant rain event, the city gets into response and recovery mode quickly after. Please stay safe out there.
Okay, today is Tuesday, March 26, 2024. It is 6 p.m. We are in the city chambers, and I call the city commissioner regular mission, regular meetings to order. If everyone could take their seats. Uh, we have uh, Commissioner McDowell present, Commissioner Langdon, myself, Mayor White, Vice Mayor Stokes, and Commissioner Emmerich is absent, but there is a quorum present for this meeting. Also present, we have City Manager Fletcher, City Attorney Slayton. We have City Clerk Faust, Board Specialist Bodmer. And I know I saw uh, Police Chief Garrison in the house. Yes, is still there. And uh, I have to put the number Fire down. Chief Titus, right? Yeah, there he is. Thank you very much. I, I like that you wear that white shirt because I can I see you through that glass. <laughs> um, for the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to call on Larry. Grant to lead us. I watch you guys on TV. So I got a big mic. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank Yeah. Um, yes, Madam Mayor. If, if it pleases the commission, can we please move number three in front of number two? Okay. So I would need a motion for that. Okay. Well, we already have a motion and a second, so I'll make an amendment to the motion, Mayor. Mm -hmm. To move item 3A. It doesn't have to be amended. You can just restate it. She did not repeat your motion. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll, re I'll restate right. the Go motion. I move to approve the agenda moving um, item 3A present, uh, presentation by Ron Cutsinger in front of item 2 general public comment. Second. All right, so we have a motion made by Commissioner Langdon to approve the agenda, but moving um, item three to be uh, before public comment. And that was seconded by Commissioner McDowell. Nothing else, let's vote. And that passes four to zero. All right, so we're going to move to item three, presentations. Sarasota County Commissioner Ron Kutzinger, the floor. All right, yours. good evening, commissioners. Thank you for having me this evening. Yes, my name is Ron Kutzinger. I am Sarasota County Commissioner for District 5, South County, the best of all five districts for sure, the fastest growing of all five districts, and the most exciting of all five districts. So it's good to be here. Speaking of that, Hopefully you've seen the improvements uh, moving ahead on River Road. We're excited to see that taking shape. And when we first started that project, the design was to six lane it from US 41 out to Center Road, and then from Center out to I-75 is was four lane. Well, the good news is, believe it or not, that project came in um, a lot better than we expected in terms of price under budget. And so what we're able to do at this point is we're going to be six laning the entire stretch of River Road from 41 all the way out to I-75. I was so glad that, uh, you know, sometimes we do these things and we realize right after we get them done, we need to add another lane. Well, it's great to be able to do that this time. And we were very fortunate that that came in ahead of budget. And I'll talk about it in a minute, but. I've been telling the uh, contractors, just stay here and go south and finish the south <laughs> section while you're here. They're fine with that. They just said they need money. So we're working on that. Um, also wanted to, uh, you remember here not that long ago, we did have a joint meeting between Northport and Sarasota County. One of the things that came out of that was the uh, reconstituting of the Mosquito Task Force to kind of look at the recommendations that had been made progress and just uh, do a review of that. Very fortunately, the original members of that task force who were subject matter experts, all of them agreed to come back together. They met now on March 1st. They had their first meeting uh, at the Mosquito Control Facility in Sarasota, and they spent a lot of time reviewing the recommendations that had been made, the implementations, and uh, working on that. The next meeting 
for the task force and we wanted it to be in South County so that it could be available to those who are here in Northport. That meeting is scheduled for April 2nd, that's this Tuesday, between 2 and 4 p.m. in the veranda room at the Northport Library. That's the one on US 41, not the Shannon Staub Library. That's here on 41, April 2nd, 2024, from 2 to 4 p.m., veranda room at the Northport Library. There will be opportunity for public comment, so encourage anyone who wants to be part of that to join that meeting. And then a third meeting, a third meeting will be scheduled for uh, May 10th uh, back at Mosquito Control. And along those lines, we have broken ground on the new Mosquito Control facility right at Laurel Road and I-75, a great central location, much closer to South County. That's coming out of the ground now. We're very excited about what that's going to do for this area. With that, there's another issue I just want to kind of bring to your attention. I think it's a great little uh, piece of news. We, in December of 21, Sarasota County purchased a parcel on San Mateo. Uh, it was one of Northport's priority projects that they wanted to see purchased through the Neighborhood Parkland Program. I've given you a packet. Perhaps you're familiar with this. Staff met with your staff about two weeks ago talking about this property. What we would love to see is we would like to see this property conveyed to the city of Northport. And then along with that, we would be able to uh, put in some of the startup money that we put aside when we uh, bought this project to look at what could be done here, some improvements. You know, it's not going to be a major park, but it's a really nice park, park, pocket park. And it does, it is adjacent to property that the city already owns. And in fact, it connects to the uh, Atwater Park out there north of the uh, high school. And so it's a great little piece of property. We were able to purchase that little corner lot on San Mateo as well. It's not shown here in the red outline, but we did purchase that. And we also sent letters to all of the small parcels that line New London Street there for purchase. And if we have willing sellers, we'll buy those as well mm -hmm. and do all we can to make this a really nice park for the community. So love to collaborate with you, get our staff together and see how we can move that forward. I certainly support that. And then uh, giving you, I've given you another update and obviously this is kind of the most important thing we're working on right now. As you know, after Hurricane Ian, came through and devastated many in our community and did almost immeasurable damage. One of the things we did as a county is we reached out for a grant from the Housing and Urban Development Department. We swung for the fences when we asked for that grant. We asked for $150 million. We thought we were really stretching it and they didn't, you know, they didn't agree with 150. They came back and they awarded us $201.5 million. We weren't upset with them about that, actually. And we decided to go ahead and keep the extra $50 million. But um, what I've got here for you is, um, and I'm proud, one of the things I'm very proud about that is that it was a direct allocation to Sarasota County. No middleman, no one taking funds out of it. No one you know, saying how we're going to use this money between us and the grant. So that's a very positive thing. One of only four counties in the state that received direct allocation speaks to how they feel about the way Sarasota has dealt with grant monies. We're very proud of that. But I'll just go through these quickly. The sheets in front of you. Um, we categorize them, first of all, was housing, homeowner rehabilitation and reconstruction. For those whose homes were destroyed, and need to be rebuilt, we allocated $40 million of the grant. Homeowner reimbursement, this is for those who have experienced out-of-pocket expenses, not reimbursed by insurance or FEMA. And so they paid for them up front because they needed to get it done, but they had to pay out-of-pocket. They will be able to um, ask for reimbursement for some, or maybe even all of those funds, depending on their status. Obviously, HUD is dealing with, and, and one of the criteria that we work with is low to moderate income families. So they're gonna to have to qualify, but this money will be available to reimburse them for expenses they have spent out of pocket. Um, that launch date uh, is in April. So we're looking to open up those applications next month. So keep your eyes open for that. On the housing, one of the things that uh, HUD of course is trying to 
do is help. There are a lot of displaced families and housing is their focus. So we um, have allocated $40 million to affordable housing projects. That application opened up March 20th. It just opened up. It will be open through May 1st, 2024. Sarasota County is setting the bar on doing all we can to create affordable housing. You may recall when the ARPA funds came in, we allocated $25 million of our $80 million allocation. We were the number one county in the state in terms of how much money, percentage of money of ARPA funds that we allocated to uh, affordable housing. And now when this came through, my comment was, let's do something big. We've got, you know, you don't get many chances to have a, a, a number like this. So let's do something big. And so we allocated $40 million to these projects. And what we want to see happen here, we don't want to just fund projects individually. What we want to do is see a number of projects come through where we can leverage these dollars and create, you know, a thousand or more affordable housing units. We, with the $25 million from ARPA, we were able to create about 700 affordable housing units. So what can we do with $40 million? And so we're excited to see nonprofits, community partners, community foundations, private developers. We're looking at all aspects. We want to be creative. We want to leverage these dollars. And we really want to make a difference in terms of affordable housing. And I would love to see a lot of it down here in Northport. So we're looking to see that happen. I know I've talked to a lot of people who are very excited about it, looking at possibilities. So if you know someone, if you have contacts, if you have a way to kind of Help someone say, hey, come to Northport and build, build a, a project here. We'll get on board to the best of our ability and, and make that happen. There are some voluntary housing buyouts, and that's in areas that continually are flooded. So, And in this goal for $6.5 million, what we're trying to do is probably have some contiguous areas that are just problem areas and maybe do some buyouts in, 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 those, in those areas. As you know, infrastructure is a huge need. We allocated $45 million to infrastructure. We've received those applications. You might be surprised to know that we've received requests for more money than we have. <laughs> Big surprise. So, <laughs> so we could use another couple hundred million dollars. Um, but what is helpful is prioritizing those projects because Northport has a lot of need. And there's some great projects. Very excited about some of the projects that have been applied for. They're just all good, but we're not going to be able to fund them all, or we're going to have to fund some of them partially. So we're going to work together to make those dollars stretch as far as possible. But again, uh, your work will be to prioritize them so we know, okay, how do we how do we spread these dollars out and have the biggest impact that we can have? $25 million, and this is a project I've been pounding the table on uh, since I became a commissioner. $25 million is allocated to improving South River Road. That road was flooded for days and people were trapped. They couldn't get out. It's our only evacuation route. And I'm working with every agency I know how, with the MPO, I'm working with our legislators, I'm working with Congressman Stubbe, I'm reaching out, I'm working, actually, I'm working with the developer, and we're trying to come together to see how do we get this project done sooner rather than later. So we're putting all our energy that we can to get that project done. And then another thing, I think is a really important project. Um, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs, and then a lot of jobs are created in terms of recovery and rebuilding and things that the projects that we're talking about here with infrastructure and with new affordable housing, that's going to take people to build. And, and so what we're trying to do is say, if we can help retrain people or we get people trained in these careers, that's a very positive economic thing, but it's great for our community. So we allocated $15 million dollars to career and trades training. And I think there's some great opportunities in Northport. Maybe out at the Shannon Stop Center, maybe we're gonna create a, a workforce training facility and get some of the private industries involved and see what we can do to help people get trained. So this is a great opportunity. That's going to be opening up, the applications for that's gonna be opening up in May. So again, all of these categories, great opportunities. I know you guys have been working with our staff on this. Uh, as best you can to get these dollars out most efficiently, as quick as we can. I'm very proud of staff because they've been moving very quickly on getting, we know how desperate the money is needed. We're moving very quickly to get this out. Every week we're getting an update. 
we're just trying to get things done as quickly as we can. So um, I also, on the uh, affordable housing, I gave you a sheet on that. That's the second sheet. That's, that's the one that just opened up. That'll be receiving applications through May 1st. So again, mm -hmm. the sooner those get in, the sooner we can get them qualified, hopefully, and the sooner we can get them built. Um, so a lot of good things happening. Thank you for having me with you and look forward to working on these things with you together. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the update. Okay, good information. All right, let's move on to public comment. Jill Luke, I am in opposition to the haste that is being applied to the potential PD station. Government, as a general rule, takes time in planning projects to avoid unintended consequences, which I can appreciate, as I learned and viewed such practices over my time in service. Though the knowledge of a need for a PD station has been noted for several years, the actual planning of this unfunded project has not occurred. There is not a full plan as to how it will be completely funded, but yet it is being addressed as though it is an emergency, when it is not. This project needs to be fully planned and vetted before being set into motion. The impact to residential and commercial properties and the options being discussed currently are too much for a growing city to bear. There is no mad rush commission. Take your time, vet it completely to do it right the first time. There is different options to be considered that haven't been vetted fully. Moving on with the first option without contemplating other options is always a dangerous path to take. The safety of our city lies with the service of our men and women who wear the uniform, not the office or space they work out of. I'm grateful for every one of them and the devotion and loyalty that they show to our community. Thank you. And in person, we have Deborah Placencia, followed by Valley Oleander. Wow, I have to follow that with the county commissioner. Man, that was great news. Um, I'm going to cut mine down. Because, <laughs> y'all, I've met with every one of you, uh, including city manager Fletcher, um, and had numerous discussions. And so you know the issue with our Dalewood Circle, little land island that's in area, um, in the AC6 area, and has been permitted for 29 homes, but that was cut off in October last year because there was an understanding now that it wouldn't fit in. Um, my concern is that I have... I have talked to every department. I have talked to the Zoning and Advisory Board. I've presented at many numerous public comments about this issue. I've talked to as many city leaders as I can, and I'm just really struggling with the lack of remediation or discussion of this issue and even the possibility of the city commissioners carving out our little neighborhood, which is only about under 2% of the total undeveloped land. Our, our community is developed. We have 29 homes and we have lots in there. When you rezone to something new, those lot owners can't use their property, but we still have to pay property taxes on it. Those 29 homes are now non-conforming structures, which means if, if they burn or some other natural cost takes them, they can't rebuild unless they meet the criteria of the new zoning. Um, they can't expand any other structure. Those won't be allowed because you have to do what's in AC6 for multifamily, industrial, and commercial. That isn't going to happen on our on individual lots. We're under a quarter acre with only 80 foot square footage. I mean, the, the, even the smallest land use townhome is 100 foot. You, you can see we it's unusable. Our lots are unusable, and that just is not fair or just. Um, so the city's air is now an opportunity. The land use in this neighborhood community has changed since the 17-year-old comp plan was initiated, and the city allowed permitting for 29 single-family homes. This small percentage of land will not detract from the overall land use proposal for AC6. So what's it going to take? And, and Mr. Fletcher, in our meeting, you said the city commission could take this up for discussion and possibly look at the best interest of our lot and, and homeowners now and allow us to continue building. We have three home, home permits hold on hold. We're ready to go. <laughs> so, you know, why, why let a maybe or a perhaps 
of leaving non-conforming status of these homes or <coughs> lots unable to be built on because of this little issue of a non-discussion. Um, are city leaders going to continue to kick the can down the road of hard decisions, as I heard Mr. Fletcher say at one time, by not addressing this issue? Please take this opportunity. We should have a discussion regarding this. Uh, we're just as important as right. discussing artwork near Walgreens and Heron Creek. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. I am Valdi Ollender, uppercase V, lowercase A, L, D, Y, uppercase O, lowercase L, E, N, D, E, R. I come here in peace. I am not a criminal. Why, why don't you, I am instructing you to remove that policeman off my back. You and him intimidating me, assaulting, and stalking. Respect my dignity. As Northport Police Department core values preach, they obey people's dignity, obey what is written. Now I'm going to tell you the story of the truth. The lie said to the truth. Let's take the bait together and in well water is very nice. The truth still suspicious, tested the water and found out it really was nice. So they got naked and baited. But suddenly the lie leaped out of the water and fled, wearing the clothes of the truth. The truth furious climbed out of the well to get her clothes back. But the world, upon seeing the naked truth, looked away with anger and contempt. Poor truth returned to the well and disappeared forever, hiding her shame. Since then, the line, lie runs around the world dressed as the truth. And society is very happy because the world has not desired to know naked truth. Jean-Léon Jérôme, 1986. Now is the question to you. By using my first and last name in all capital letters, change me from one, one people of we the people with God-given rights to a corporation with no rights but privileges. Answer. Never you heard about this stuff? Instead, being you boss, become some people, some human, a sheep. Answer. Are you claiming jurisdiction by trickery, fraud? Are you conspired to the fraud with the people? I have objection and no concern to this Palestine style checkpoint. Get the act together. All right, thank you. Oh, that's it. Okay. All right, let's move on to announcements. City Clerk. The current vacancies for the following boards and committees include the Art Advisory Board, Auditor Selection Committee, Charter Review Advisory Board, Citizens Tax Oversight Committee, Environmental Advisory Board, Police Officers Pension Trust Fund Board of Trustees, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, Veterans Park Advisory Board, and Zoning Board of Appeals. Sarasota <coughs> County Advisory Council vacancies include one resident of Northport to serve on the Citizens Advisory Committee and one resident of Northport to serve on the Citizens Oversight Committee for School Facility Planning. If anyone would like more information, please see the City Clerk's <coughs> Office. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda, City Manager, any items been pulled? Uh, no, Madam Mayor. 
Mayor? Yes. I'm sorry. I, I originally requested something to be pulled, had a conversation with the city attorney and was comfortable in not pulling a specific item. At this time, in light of an email that I just received, I have one follow-up question. I sent it to him. I didn't get a response. So I would <coughs> like to pull item D, the interlocal agreement about trespassing. Okay. So I'm looking for uh, a motion. I'll make a motion. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda, pulling item D for discussion. Okay. We have a motion made by Commissioner McDowell to approve the consent agenda, <coughs> pulling item D for discussion. Second. All right, and that's seconded by Vice Mayor Stokes. Nothing else. Let's vote. And that passes four to zero. All right, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, so my question had to do with the map and the green um, highlighted areas that are going to be part of this agreement. <coughs> Some of them were in the city limits. Some of them were not. The late, I was comfortable with the explanation that I was given, but now I need to know, are these new PID numbers going to be added to the agreement? They're, they're conversing. They're conversing. <clears throat> Hello again, Commissioners. Caitlin Coughlin, Assistant City Attorney. No, that's okay. Um, so I just saw the additional PIDs. Um, if we do approve the contract today and these need to be added as part of a jurisdiction after the county agrees to that, then we can absolutely the city manager approving those manager approving those. So let me try my question again. Okay. The one, so we have the exhibit that has a list of all the PID numbers that are included in this agreement. Some of the PID numbers outlined in the email I just received, my fellow commissioners have not received, citizens have not received, are those going to be added to the agreement? That will at this time have to be up to the county in the agreement. If, if those are within, if they find that to be within the jurisdiction of the city, um, then they can add those at that time. But at this time, with the agreement we have with the county, the PIDs that are indicated on Exhibit A are the only are the only partial ID numbers that are included in this agreement for purposes of law enforcement going out and potentially doing a trespass in those areas. The agreement is for county-owned property within city limits. If it gets amended at the county level, how are we and the citizens going to, are we going to weigh in then afterwards? Can we wait and see what the county says? So at this point, uh, Commissioner, Madam Mayor and the board, what the agreement that is before you is the agreement that is attached to the agenda in the backup material. That's what's being presented for approval. Mm -hmm. If the city does not want to approve that agreement and wants to make changes to that agreement, that would require the agreement of both parties. Now, that being said, <coughs> um, the language within this interlocal agreement does also allow these exhibits to be modified by the parties with the county administrator and the city manager's <coughs> approval. So that does not have to come back before the board. What the commissioner is referring to is an, an email that, uh, as she mentioned, was transmitted, I think, since this meeting began, where there's a question asking for some PID numbers and there's an answer about that. 
That's not what is before the board at this time. That's not something that's been negotiated into this agreement. So the answer, Commissioner, to your question is at this time, no, these PIDs will not be added to this agreement. If the police department and the city manager and the county administrator all agree that it should be modified in some way, this agreement gives them the right to do that without bringing it back before the commission, provided that both entities approve the agreement. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. I'm comfortable. Okay, anything further? No. All right, looking for a motion then for item D. I'll make a motion. Go ahead. I'll make a motion to approve the. No. <clears throat> I make a motion to approve the interlocal agreement relating to the trespass authority for the county owned parks and facilities located within the city limits by and between the Sarasota County and the city of Northport. I'll second. All right, we have a motion made by Commissioner McDowell to approve the interlocal agreement relating to trespass authority for county owned parks and facilities located within the city of Northport than the city, city limits of North, city of Northport by and between Sarasota County, Florida, and the city of Northport, Florida. That was seconded by the vice mayor, Stokes. There's nothing else. Let's vote. And that passes four to zero. Okay, next up we have item six, which is presentations of Awaken Outreach Center 2023 Annual Report of Activities. All right, uh, City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this is their annual report, uh, and I believe that former City Fire Chief yeah. Bill Taft will be providing this report. Thank you, City Manager. For the record, Bill Taft, Fire Chief, Fire Chief. Here we go. <laughs> Scott Titus. I'm sorry. <laughs> habits die hard. Don't uh, it? Habits die hard. Even after all those years. <laughs> Awaken Board of Directors, uh, Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager, City Attorney, and City Clerk, thank you for having us here today. As you all know, we lease property from the city at the Community Center on Pan American. And so each year we bring before you an annual report of our activities at that Community Center. Uh, this year, and it's new, May of 2023, so we're not even a year old, we have incorporated in a nonprofit status as Awaken Outreach Center Incorporated. Um, that opens up the ability for us to seek larger and more funding through grants and other avenues. Uh, we are still affiliated with the church. Pastor Brian Zadravi is still our chairperson of the board. Um, and Pastor uh, Larry Grant, along with his wife, Chantel, uh, he's our outreach minister for the, church, for the uh, center. We have lots of partner organizations, and first up is the city of Northport. Without us being able to get that lease and utilize those, that property for the purposes of serving the community and uh, their need of those who are underserved and undernourished in our community, um, we wouldn't be able to, to work at all. Um, we have All Face Food Bank, one of our major partners, Mayor's Feeding the Hungry, Northport Senior Center. Uh, they, we cohabitate with them. And they're wonderful partners. They come right alongside us, and, and we use a lot of their space from time to time uh, in joint activities. Uh, Sarasota County Schools. Uniquely, uh, we sign off on students for their uh, high school graduation community service hours and also uh, for their college community service so that they can put on their applications. So it's a good partnership. The schools also provide us later on, you'll see a little bit more um, some needs that we try to fill for them. Sarasota County Court and Probation System, uh, offenders can come to us and work off their community service. The unique part about this is a lot of them stay on longer than the hours they need to work. And it's, it's amazing, they just love the work that we're doing out there. Uh, Hope for Communities and Day for Hope, Mothers Helping Mothers. Our Outreach Center programs in 2023, of course, our food pantry is our number one 
and we are open five days a week with Friday being a drive-through service. Um, we've moved our hours back a little bit. We're at 8 a.m. is when we open until noontime. Um, we do the Day for Hope. Again, we receive the names of the children in our community who don't have the proper supplies and equipment to go to school, and those come from the school. We take them and we supply them with just about everything that they need. We have uh, food assistance registrations. Um, Pastor Larry and myself and a couple of others loaded up a 24-foot box truck and another trailer, 18-foot trailer, and headed up two days after Adalia and paid it forward to those that came to us during the hurricane. Ian, we went up there and paid it forward and opened up an, a, a community service center there. We ran out of supplies in six hours. That's how big the need was. Care team counseling, um, community service day. Of course, we help Northport with their Easter egg hunt, the postal drive, t-shirts for turkeys, which is a wonderful way of fundraising uh, and getting turkeys for everyone for Thanksgiving. Um, we've got a new partner, Jesus Loves You. Uh, we bring in a shower trailer for those uh, that are homeless in our community and need a nice hot shower. So uh, they come to us, they set it up, and um, it's available. Uh, food pantry for Thanksgiving meals and Hope for Christmas Children's Outreach. Feeding the community, that is our primary service. It is our primary mission. Our Friday drive through pantry sees between 600 and 750 cars, which reaches approximately 2,000 to 2,500 persons. A car is filled with food every 30 seconds, and we keep them moving as fast as we can. Our walk-up pantry operations serve an additional 700 persons a week for the extra hours that were open. Take a look at the number on the right. Nearly 2.3 million pounds of food were served last year out of the food pantry. That's 500,000 pounds more than in 2022. The need is here, the need is great. One of our biggest things that we're seeing lately is an influx of Ukrainians who are here as refugees and they need support in all ways not just food, but clothing and other assistance. And we're there to try and help them through whatever we can. Day for Hope, talked a little bit about that. Again, what a wonderful day to prepare people for school. They start the morning or afternoon, uh, depending on what session that they are registered for with either breakfast or lunch. We provide an eye exam, a dental checkup, a school physical, so they can play sports. They have access to community services. They receive haircuts, school photos, a backpack full of supplies, a hygiene backpack full of supplies. This is my favorite part because I usually get to do this. I give out gift cards for clothing and shoes to the children. You know, when they get a $25, or $30, $50 gift card in, in their hand and they get to go shopping for themselves, that's pretty unique for children that have not had that opportunity before. And then they walk out with food for the family. Detweiler's provides all kinds of food for us for that day. We expanded it this year and we did Hope for Christmas. We took the same children that were given to us by the schools, but we also adopted their siblings. And we provided not just toys, meals, and they wrote their own gift list. So they gave us what they wanted, their wish list for Christmas. We tried to provide it the best we could. And then if you look at the left and the top, we opened it up to the parents to come in and do extra shopping so there were surprise things under the tree for the children. And then our wonderful police department wrapped all the gifts along with some of our volunteers. And the fire department came in and did some unique things with the Jaws of Life. Those, ki those kids were amazed, absolutely amazed. By the numbers, families served just over 48,000. Individuals served at the food pantry, 133,000 plus. Our Thanksgiving meal saw 1,000 families served with 2,650 individuals. Our community day, where we reach out to our homeless or needy populations, individuals served 3,300 and hot meals served 1,800. 
our children's ministries, our Day for Hope and Hope for Christmas, you see the numbers there. Our care team counseling with Chantel Leeds with a nice group of volunteers, 332 clients served. And Mothers Helping Mothers, where the Mothers Helping Mothers program brings in a trailer full of clothing and baby needs, um, toddler items, and the mothers can shop for their children and get the things that they need, diapers, formula, and all kinds of things. Individuals served in 2023 at the Awaken Outreach Center provided by the city of Northport through a lease, 140,548 individuals. Couldn't be done without our volunteers. 35,633 volunteer item hours. Many of you, staff included, have been there and volunteered, and we appreciate it. The Awaken Outreach Center is there to meet the needs of this community, and we are also looking for additional space. We hope one day to build our own facility where we can reach out and provide more services to this community. And I want to thank you for your time, and we will take any questions if, if you have any. All right, thank you. Good seeing you again, too. Good seeing you. All right, any questions or comments? Commissioner McDowell. Extremely impressive every time you give the annual report to the commission. Um, I have no words for what Awaken Church does and your volunteers do for our community and for our citizens and visitors. Thank you very much for everything. It's Pastor Larry. <laughs> Without his vision, we wouldn't be there. Commissioner Langdon. Yes, I just have to echo um, Commission McDowell's comments, Awaken Church. Don't tell anybody I said this, but Awaken Church is my favorite <laughs> organization <laughs> in the city of Northport. Um, and, and I love volunteering when I can. You guys make such a difference. And I'm delighted you've gone for your 401c, your 501c3. That will, that will yes. indeed make a huge difference in your ability to fundraise. So um, we're lucky to have you guys here in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. I would just say that this city is very blessed to have you folks, all that you do for our people. Um, perfect example of how to give back. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I uh, echo those comments and I have partaken in, in those, a couple of those Friday uh, giveaways and I'd say I was, very impressed with the organization because I love plan and organization. And, and you definitely have it down pat. I, I just have a question. This is this limited to this not just limited to Northport residents. Oh no, we serve South Sarasota County. And um, we also can serve Port Charlotte, but not through our USDA food program. So they receive other goods, but not through the USDA because it's reserved to this county. All right, and, and for those who may not know, do they have to have a card or something or anybody can just show up? They can show up and we will register. Of course, we'll never turn anyone away that needs right. anything, but we will register them and that is to keep track of the numbers so that we can apply for more food. Okay, um, There are limits, on, again, with any free giveaway, there are limits on income and things of that nature, but we try to supply everyone because we don't know what the needs are. Right, so the, do they have to sign up prior to the Friday, or can they just show up that day? We like them to come during one of our daytime operations okay. at the food pantry and sign up there. Then we can have their card ready when they come in in their car and we can give it to them, okay. and then they just move on through. Okay, I just needed a refresher on that. Yes, ma'am. The people, thank you. All right, um, I don't see anything else, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, do we have any public comment on that? Okay, so we move on to item seven, which is public hearings. Moving on to petition A, consideration of petition PLF-23-251, Lakespur at Welland Park, phase three, final plat. This is quasi-judicial. Uh, City Clerk, can you read this by petition title? 
consideration of petition PLF-23-251 Lakespur at Welland Park Phase 3 Final Plat. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge so help you God? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to call for disclosure of any ex parte communications. Commissioner McCall? None. Commissioner Langdon? None. I have nothing. Vice Mayor? I also have nothing. All right. City Clerk, do we have any aggrieved parties? All right. We're going to start with presentation by the applicant. John, did you stand when I swore everybody in? I did not. I didn't think you did. <laughs> Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to help you God? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hello, John Lezinski, Senior Vice President with Welland Park, and I have now been sworn. <laughs> Uh, this plat is for 90 additional single family lots in Lakespur, which is in our Village K neighborhood. It will be the last plat of that area. If you remember, uh, Village K is west of River Road, mm -hmm. south of Minnesota Beach Road, and east of West Village Parkway and north of the city county line. The west portion is known as Everly. It's got 241 very upscale homes. Uh, and west part of it, or the east part of it, has Lakespur, which has single family homes being built by Lenar and Pulte Homes. And we have some coach homes that will be offered to the marketplace later this year by Matt. This is just a continuation of an existing program. That's all I've got. <laughs> Boy, that was no pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm sorry, staff. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the uh, City Commission. Hank Flores, Planning and Zoning Manager. I have been sworn. Uh, this is the application of John Lezinski for of Minnesota Beach Ranch Lands for a final plat approval for, as he said, Lake Spirit Wellen Park, Phase 3. The plat consists of 91 single-family lots and associated improvements on 29.17 acres land located uh, see, between South River Road and Moonflower Drive here, and it's about 0 0.6 miles south of Minnesota Beach Road. On March 7, 2024, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board recommended approval of the petition. The final plat was reviewed and approved by Steve Watts, PSM, for conformance with Florida Statutes Chapter 177, Part 1 and was also reviewed by city staff and found to be in conformance with chapter 37 subdivision regulations of the unified land development code uh, staff is therefore recommending approval of the proposed plat final plat for uh file number plf 23 251 lake spur at welland park phase three all right thank you moving on to rebuttal by the applicant there are none. Okay. Rebuttal by staff? Oh, no, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Do we have any public comment? And moving on to questions. Commissioner, questions. Just wait for it. Nope, nothing. Okay. So moving on to closing arguments. No grieving party, so move to staff. Oh, well, this is what's on here. Any questions? Closing arguments? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay, applicant? None. Okay. So I close this portion of the public hearing and request a motion. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead. I move to approve the Lakeshore at Welland Park Phase 3 Final Plat, petition number PLF-23-251, and find that based on competent and substantial evidence, the plat is consistent with Florida Statutes Section 177.081, the Unified Land Development Code, and the Northport Comprehensive Plan. Second. 
All right, we do have a motion to approve the Lake Spur at Welland Park Phase 3 final plat petition number PLF-23-251 and find that based on the competent and substantial evidence, the plat is consistent with Florida Statute Section 177.081, the Unified Land Development Code and the Northport Comprehensive Plan. And we have a second it by the Vice Mayor. Anything else? Okay. Coach. And that passes four to zero. Thank you for that. Moving on to item B. Yep. Um, and this is again. Well, okay. I. I will say it. CC PLF-23-259, consideration of petition PLF-23-259, Welland Park, downtown, phase two, final plat. This is quasi-judicial. City clerk, I already read, well, go ahead if you want to read it again, and swear in those who want <laughs> I'm taking your job away from you, I'm sorry. <laughs> swear in those wishing to provide testimony. Consideration of petition PLF-23-259, Welland Park, Downtown, Phase 2, Final Plat. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? So help you that. I do. Thank you. All right. I'm calling for disclosure of ex parte communications. Commissioner McDowell? None. Commissioner Langdon? None for me. I have nothing. Vice Mayor? Nothing here. Okay. City Clerk, do we have any aggrieved parties? None. Okay, so we're moving to presentation by the applicant. John Lazinski, Senior Vice President of Welland Park. This you have is been a, sworn, correct? I have been sworn. It's okay. the right time this time. Yes. This is a 52.25 acre parcel that's bound by US 41 on the north, Radiant Way on the east, Sun Glow, which is and acting as the main access from the west into downtown and Prado. This is really a post closing obligation. Track 101 was acquired just about a year ago from HCA, by HCA Hospital, a future hospital, and they're in the process of securing their uh, first deal, which is going to be the emergency room, which we expect uh, in the month of April. So we should be seeing that very soon to commence construction. The balance of the property is being platted in three separate tracks that we will market, you know, in the future. Mostly, we anticipate mostly non-residential uses that will play off the hospital, but they could be some type of mixed use as it ties, as you go south and east, that ties into the apartments to the east, the Tropy apartments, and uh, obviously downtown. That's all I have. All right, thank you. All right, staff. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Hank Flores, Planning Manager, uh, Planning and Zoning Manager for the record. I have been sworn. Uh, John Lazinski of Main Street and Ranchlands has applied for final plat approval for Welland Park downtown phase two. Final plat proposes the creation of a four lot commercial subdivision, as he said, 52.23 acres of land located on the south side of South Tamiami Trail, east of Preto. Boulevard, which is this road here, uh, northwest of Sunglow Boulevard, which is this other road here, and Radiant Way, which is right here. So it's the west of Radiant Way. On March 7, 2024, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board voted to recommend approval of the petition. The final plat was reviewed and approved by Steve Watts, PSM, for conformance with Florida Statutes, Chapter 177, Part 1. It was also reviewed by city staff and found to be in conformance with chapter 37 subdivision regulations of the Unified Land Development Code. Staff is therefore recommending approval of petition PLF 23259 for the Welland Park downtown phase two final plan. All right, thank you. Moving on to rebuttals, applicant, we have a rebuttal. Applicant has no rebuttal. All right, staff, rebuttal? Uh, no, ma'am. All right, any public comment? There is none. All right, do we have any commissioner questions? 
And I'm not seeing any, so let's move to closing arguments. No aggrieved party, so staff, closing arguments? Uh, no, ma'am. Applicant, any closing arguments? No, ma'am. All right, so I'm going to close this portion of the public hearing and request a motion. I'll make it. Go ahead. I move to approve the Welland Park Downtown Phase 2 Final Plat, petition number PFL-23-259, and find that based on the competent and substantial evidence, plat is consistent with the Florida Statute Section 177.081, Unified Land Development Code, and the North Port Comprehensive Plan. All right, so we have a motion to approve the Welland Park Downtown Phase Two Final Plat Petition Number PLF-23-259, and find that based on the competent and substantial evidence, the plat is consistent with Florida Statute Section 177.081, the Unified Land Development Code, and the North Port Comprehensive Plan. Do I have a second? Second. And seconded by Commissioner McDowell. If there's nothing else, let's. Oh. And that passes four to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on to item C. Ordinance second reading two zero two four dash. Zero one, City Clerk, can you read this by title only? Ordinance number 2024-01, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, adopting certain standards of the International Property Maintenance Code related to the exterior maintenance of residential and non-residential properties, buildings, and structures. Amending the Code of the City of Northport, Florida, Chapter 42, Article 5, Section 42-84 through 42-86, providing for finding, providing for conflict, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. All right, thank you. City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, during the first reading at the Commission regular meeting on February 13, 2024, a motion was made by the City Commission to continue Ordinance Number 2024-01 to second reading on March 26, 2024, and to direct the Charter Officer to add residential properties in the title block and throughout the document. <clears throat> Due to the City Commission's requested amendment to Ordinance Number 2024-01, Re-advertising of the ordinance what was on March 26, 2024, Commission regular meeting was required. Uh, in accordance with the Florida statute, Section 166.0414, a business impact estimate was posted on the city's website on January 25th, 2024. But this time we ask for adoption of this resolution, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, any commissioner questions? Mr. McDowell. Yeah, this is a long time coming and I wanna thank staff for getting this done. Um, I do have a, a question that's more related to the citizens. Um, what are the next steps to be able to gain compliance for Lake Popeyes, uh, the dome house, uh, the various incomplete housing um, startups that have not been touched for years. How, how does compliance look with this adoption? Good evening, Elena Ray, Director of Development Services. Um, we first intend to educate. We will be contacting property owners that, uh, specifically at first, the commercial property owners that we know have had um, some long-term problems. Um, the ones that were just mentioned on the dais uh, among them. Um, we will be making them aware of this new ordinance and giving them a deadline to comply uh, with completing those repairs or we will go through the formal code enforcement process. Um, I would imagine that those notices would go out within about 30 days uh, of the effective date of this ordinance. Uh, for the residential, um, we do understand that a lot of our residents have um, issues with hurricane damage and those types of things. So um, primarily at first we want to begin with the long-term issues that we've had related to some uh, burned out homes and those types of things. This gives us additional authority to address those. 
So we will be contacting those property owners and um, following those same steps. Um, we will be, for, for our other homes that may not be quite as severe as that, um, we will be providing additional um, education, letting them know what the ordinance says, working with them as to the steps for compliance and helping them through whatever permitting processes they might need. Oh, help me and the citizens understand what code compliance looks like with this new code versus the old way of code enforcement. So it, the process is still the same. Uh, our code enforcement process will not change. It's just that this gives us additional um, regulatory tools from the standpoint of what these property owners have to comply with. Um, where before, uh, it, for instance, a home that's burned out, if it was boarded up and uninhabitable, as long as, as long as it was boarded up, that's all they had to do and they could leave it there for perpetuity. Now they can't do that. They will either have to return it to a habitable state or they will have to demolish the home. Thank you very much. I know there's a lot of citizens that have been following this closely and um, I appreciate you sharing with them what these next steps look like. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, actually, I had a question. Don't go anywhere. Yes. Because <laughs> uh, I've had people asking me, some residents, about the, the blue tarps. Does this, does this fall under this? They wanted to know how long can somebody keep a blue tarp on their roof, and I had no idea. Did so they? essentially, we, we understand that people are still dealing mm -hmm. with their insurance companies. Uh, I think we probably all have them in our neighborhoods. <laughs> some, of, some of us just recently got them off of our roofs. But, um, so we do understand that. What this would be more um, looking at, and certainly this isn't our first priority because there are some more serious um, properties that mm -hmm. we need to address. But, uh, and I haven't necessarily seen this in Northport. They may have some, but in a couple of other places I've seen where the blue tarps were no longer functioning. They were literally in shreds hanging off the side mm -hmm. of the home. It's that type of thing that they would need to replace the tarp so that the tarp is functional or remove the tarp. Um, but because at that point, it's not serving its purpose um, and could be creating more damage to the house by um, the, you know flapping in the wind. Mm -hmm. But um, we understand people are still dealing with hurricane damage, and we are certainly not going to add to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, do we have any public comment? Yes, ma'am. All right. So I'm closing this portion of the public hearing and looking for a motion. I'll give you a motion, Mayor. Go ahead. I move to adopt ordinance number 2024-01 as presented. All right. I have a motion made by Commissioner Langdon to adopt ordinance number 2024-01 as presented. And looking for a second. Second. Seconded by Commissioner McDowell. If there's nothing else, let's vote. And that passes four to zero. Thank you. All right, moving on to ordinance first reading. Item D, ordinance number 2024-06. Uh, city clerk, can you read this by... Need a oh, I need a motion to uh, to read this by title only. So moved. All right. We have a motion to direct the city clerk to read by title only, made by Commissioner Langdon and seconded by Commissioner McDowell. Let's vote. And that passes four to zero. All right, city clerk, take it away. Ordinance number 2024-06, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the code of the City of Northport, Florida, Chapter 4, Article 10, regarding the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. All right, and City Clerk, this is your item. On... 
January 4th, 2024, commission provided direction for the city clerk to work with the city attorney to amend section 4-191 to remove items one through 10 and to modify the board membership for the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board to a maximum of seven members with five at-large members and preferably but not more than two non-resident members. The proposed ordinance 2024 Dash 06 does address the commission's direction regarding the historic advisory board membership and term limits. Also, I wanted to note that when this does come back for second reading, an, a resolution will accompany it to reinstate the advisory board since it is suspended right now. That is all. Okay. Will accompany. Okay. Got that. All right, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, I, uh, I only have one question. Um, line 63, it says board members serving on April 1st, 2024 are deemed appointed to their first, te first term beginning on that date. We have no board members. We do not, but you had, the board had agreed that previous board members would be able to start fresh and apply once this this ordinance is passed. So in order to make it to where they are fresh slate, they can be reappointed to the board even though they've maxed, reached their term previously, wow. we had to include that in there. So once come April 9th, we're going to, hopefully if this gets approved, we'll open the board up, take in applications, and then any board member at that point will be appointed to their first term even though they previously served on the board. Thank you for that clarity. <laughs> and and if, if that's, if that's the case, City Clerk, I think we probably want to massage that language yeah. a little bit because to the commissioner's point, if there are no board members in existence on April 1st, 2024, then that's going to nullify that language. But if, if the intent is as you stated, we can work on something before second reading oh. to refine that. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions? Commissioner McDowell, are you okay? Yeah. Thank All you. Right. Uh, any public comment? All right, so I close this portion of the public hearing and looking for a motion. I'll make a motion. Okay. Um, I'll find out what the date. Hang on. <coughs> see that. Um, I move to continue ordinance number 2024-06 to second reading on April 9th with the change to line 63. All right, we have a motion made by Commissioner McDowell to move uh, to continue ordinance number 2024-06 to second reading on April 9th, 2024, with the change to include line 63. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, seconded by Vice Mayor Stokes. <coughs> There's nothing else. Let's vote. And that passes four to zero. All right, moving along here. Are we doing okay? Could we do a 10 minute health break? Do you, do you want a 10 minute health break? Okay. Uh, we, yeah, he's taking around. Pete's turn. I was, I was gonna suggest, because I what? don't what do know, there's a lot of people here. Maybe they're here for this art, because the art thing is- Oh, hard. the next one. Okay, so let's just do the I next one. I think they're here for the art thing. I, I don't know, I don't no want to speak for them, but. Okay, we'll do that. I don't know if they're here for that. We do not have public comment for, yet for the next item, so I don't know if that's what they're here for. Up to you. Um, all right, let's take a 10 minute since you asked for it. Appreciate you it. probably need it. All right, 709, we'll be back at 719. Mm -hmm. You channel your inner.
Hello everyone, my name is Mario Venditti. I am the planner scheduler for the city of Northport Solid Waste. I got into this position, um, first I was a recycle driver for five years for the city of Northport, and then I became the planner scheduler after taking an interest in educating the residents on how to recycle properly. In my position, my day-to-day, -day, usually I start out by visiting the new residents that schedule garbage and recycle containers to be delivered and I will go see them and educate them on our solid waste guidelines. More or less, I'm more focused on the recycle part of it. After that, I will drive around the city and I actually inspect recycle containers manually for contamination. And then I will take calls from drivers if there's any issues with uh, repeat garbage in the recycle and I will go educate those people as well. What I love most about the city of Northport is their residents are from all over the world and I get to learn about the solid waste guidelines where they come from as well as educate them on the city of Northport solid waste guidelines and how to recycle properly. believe that the natural resources department will be an in integral part for the city's growth as we want to achieve a more balanced approach of development in the future. What we really want to do is see sensible development, sustainable development, and development that is um, in line with what we already have here. So we want to preserve as much as we can of the uh, natural resources. So there is still place for our natural species, our, our migrating birds, and all the other species that live um, and survive in our habitat. Natural systems, are a big part of the ways ecosystems function. An important part for our community, our listed species, they stabilize the soil, they provide so many different benefits, including shade, limiting the heat island effect uh, within our city, providing habitat, providing shelter for these species, and just uh, also for our aesthetic enjoyment. Well, as an arborist, uh, a lot of what I do is making sure that development conforms to the tree protection code. So one thing we already have in place since April of 2022 is a tree protection code, which is quite robust in the city of Northport that was adopted by commission and the city through also a lot of community involvement. And so we're very happy to have that tree protection code. So what I, a lot of what I do is making sure that development either residential or commercial conforms to that code. We are such a passionate team. We come from varied backgrounds. Uh, I think between us, we have over 100 years of experience and we are every day raring to go. And you know, we know our work is cut out here and we're happy to uh, take the challenge. Through the division and community involvement and leadership in the city, we really hope to make great strides in protecting what we have here and finding that balance with development and environmental stewardship. I am excited to be a part of this team and I'm really seeking and looking forward to the opportunities for us to be able to make a difference. As a full class, TRX Bootcamp is a new class for me, although I've been using TRX for many years uh, with personal training that I do or in other style classes that I've done. But an actual focus with just TRX, this is a new class for me. I love the camaraderie, I have to say, um, with all the participants. I think we have a lot of fun. <laughs> First of all, everyone gets to use the bands, the TRX bands, of course. <laughs> And being that we have five stations, so when we have overflow or more than five people, part of the people are on the band, the other people are doing floor work, and then we'll switch. So everybody gets an opportunity to be in all stations. Just come in, have fun with it, make it your own. It's not scary, it doesn't have to be intimidating at all. You're using your body weight, you're using the angles that you choose 
to use on the bands and it just varies with how you're comfortable and how you're feeling when you're here. I started with Charlotte County Utilities as a meter reader in 2004. So that's kind of where I got my foot in the door. Then once I reached a point in my life where things were more stable, I decided to leave Charlotte County Utilities and I went and got my insurance license. It was very exciting doing that for a short period of time. But after a while, I started thinking about the utility. It was in my heart. At this point, I had almost 12, just two months shy of 12 years in. And so I realized during that time, my heart was in utilities. And so I started looking around again. I seen an opening here to be a CND tech. So I applied and I got in. Typically I get here at seven in the morning. I get my list of, you know, if I can get to this, this is what I need to do. And I get in my truck. If, if I need any supplies, parts, tools based off of the work I was given that morning, I'll pick that up here at our shop. And then I head out and um, my goal for the day is just to get as much work as that was assigned to me done as possible. And sometimes that happens and other times there's a lot of first response calls that come in. My favorite part is the uniqueness. It's um, not knowing what I'm going to be faced with every day. It could be different. It's not mundane in any way. And it's exciting when you get a call and you're you're on your way and you don't know what it is and you you have the experience and the know-how and the backing to face whatever it's going to be so i feel very confident in facing these calls and i think that's my favorite part Frank Lamas, always manager of City of Northport. Uh, here today with Mario Vendetti, planner scheduled for the City of Northport, Solid Waste Division. We're gonna talk about bulk pickups today, uh, how to schedule bulk pickups, what should go out and what should not go out to the curb, where to place the items, and then what happens if you have more than what's allotted for you for the year for a bulk pickup. So Mario, I know we call 941-240-8050, talk to our customer service reps That's correct. about how to schedule a bulk pickup. How else can we do that? You can also go on our website, northportfl.gov, click on solid waste, and fill out a bulk request form. Excellent, excellent. So Mario, what about uh, if a person wants to place it out, what should they place out? What's the right thing, what's the wrong thing? Basically, Frank, anything that doesn't fit in the container okay. that's garbage okay. is gonna go curbside, we're gonna stay off driveways. What's not accepted is tires, chemicals, okay. stuff like that. You can put yard waste out, that's considered bulk, but just make sure it's separate from the- Okay, it's 719 and I call this meeting back to order. All right, we're moving on to item eight, general business, 24-0358. City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a discussion and possible action regarding the City Commission previous action relating to the placement of artwork near Walgreens and Herring Creek and possible direction related to the associated recommendation from the Art Advisory Board for artwork. Um, I will call down Ms. Sandy Funheller, our Parks and Rec Director. Good evening, everyone. Sandy Funheller, Parks and Recreation Director. So today, staff is requesting direction uh, on two items. The first is related to lo the location of a proposed piece of art in conjunction with a developer contribution. And the second is for approval of the sculpture recommended by the Art Advisory Board. While efforts towards this project started in March of 2021, uh, through the process, staff have determined that the sculpture cannot be placed in the location originally directed, which is at the Walgreens at the corner of Price and Sumter, due to the absence of an easement. As a result, Public Works has recommended an alternate location near the new Greenway Trail on Price Boulevard, which is owned by the city, but still in proximity to Heron Creek. Um, I'd like to have Recreation Manager Shelby Mendelson, who serves as the staff liaison to the Art Advisory Board, to come up and provide some details on the proposed sculpture. Good evening, Shelby Mendelson, Recreation Manager. During the City Commission regular meeting on December 14th, 2021, the Art Advisory Board was tasked with identifying a low maintenance piece of art to be placed near the Walgreens at the corner of Sumter and Price Boulevard. 
with artwork oriented to provide maximum visibility of the piece from the intersection. Additionally, direction was provided for the city attorney to review the legalities of removing and replacing artwork at this location. In relation to the review by the city attorney, an update was provided indicating there could be consideration for other locations in this area, provided there was approval from the developer and access to private property was legally authorized by the property owner. As part of the art advisory board efforts to identify a piece of art for this project, a presentation was scheduled during the May 9th, 2023 art advisory board meeting where local artist Mike Halligan proposed a sculpture created through the utilization of salvaged materials from Hurricane Ian. The sculpture symbolizes the strength of the Northport community rebuilding in light of tragedy. On December 19th, 2023, after receiving additional supporting information related to the proposal, the Art Advisory Board made a recommendation to submit Mr. Halligan's project to the City Commission for approval. Mr. Halligan is here today um, to speak on the sculpture, the materials, and the anticipated process. Okay. Hello, my name is Mike Halligan. Thanks for having me. Um, I own a small business here in Northport. Uh, we do a lot of custom woodworking stuff, um, commercial from from commercial to artwork to residential, you name it. Um, after the hurricane, we started salvaging logs. Um, we cut a bunch of trees out of the road, and then I realized that uh, I'm from Oregon. I've lived here for a handful of years, but we realized that a lot of these were tropical trees and woods that we don't get often in Oregon, can't find. So I started stacking them up. Um, I have some friends that had a lot, and we started hauling the logs there. Um, they're beautiful pieces, and um, shortly after we started doing that, all of that, a friend of mine from the Art Center said, hey, you know, we're gonna be look they're looking for an art piece. Maybe you should put an idea for a sculpture together. Um, throughout the storm and, and the days after, we did a ton of search and rescue stuff with some friends of mine. My shop on Toledo Blade, for whatever reason, never lost power, so we just opened up, turned the air conditioner on, and had people start <laughs> sleeping there. I have a picture of about 100 people sleeping on my floor in my shop. Um, so we just, we literally stacked a table saw on top of my CNC machine to make room. Um, and it just kind of, it spoke to the community here. And I, I felt welcome since the day we moved into town. And um, and it just kind of sparked the uh, image, I guess, in my head of what this sculpture could look like. And, and um, my my intention would be, this this rendering is, was very rough. It's hard to convey digitally. Um, but I, I have a couple of logs set aside for this project. Um, once you cut into these, you never know what you're going to get. So we'll basically... Um, start processing three or four of them and pick the best one throughout the process that would, that's most um, stable and, and would work the best. But then our intention was to essentially have jagged metal, for lack of a better term, to kind of uh, show what this town went through and have it all come out and start and, and end as nice flowing um, flower petals and stems and things um, mounted to a, a large aluminum base. And then I think there's some, some stuff in about, um, it'll be mounted to a, a large, concrete pad and we'll, we'll put some additional anchors and stuff in that. Um, kind of make it a cool functional piece of art. It'll shed some rain and, and look neat. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so if, if that's Sorry, all we have, sense. so if you have questions, yeah, um, any one of the three of us can help answer those. Okay, great. Uh, Commissioner McDowell. So I think I'm the lone commissioner sitting up here that started the process with the spoon bill. And I have learned from that experience. So my first ex questions have to do with the materials. So I understand aluminum and you're going to be using wood. I want to find out what steps are going to be taken to prevent the aluminum from corroding and the wood from deteriorating and being eaten by pests? So our, our initial intentions with the wood will be, so uh, again, the rendering is kind of hard to convey digitally what we're thinking, but everywhere that that aluminum gives, goes into the wood, we'll bore a large hole through it and it'll be a, a con continuous piece through it. Initially, what we'll do is take the wood and, and suspend it essentially from a tractor um, and Florida, there's a company called Florida Paints. They make a, an all-weather epoxy. It's used on garage floors and things like that. Um, they make a substantial amount of different UV inhibitors and things like that. So with this, the, the wood side of this project, it'll be essentially bathed in this epoxy. So we'll drill the holes, get everything lined out, bathe it in epoxy, and essentially fill those holes again, and then drill. So 
the wood will be completely encapsulated and it's it's all clear it basically shines the wood up i don't know what you guys know about epoxy but it it, it polishes it up essentially um we'll, we'll do all the woodworking to it and get it how we want to look it how, how it get, get it how we want it to look sorry and then um essentially encapsulated in this epoxy resin um after that we'll we'll re-drill the holes in the same spot but the inside of those holes will be drilled a bit smaller so they the wood is completely covered in resin as far as the aluminum goes um, that will be a combination of being anodized and powder coated um, and then it's essentially protected uh, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say forever but for a very long time probably longer than any of us will be around Phew. You've learned from the spoon bill too, then. <laughs> um, the only other question I have, and and I, I mean no disrespect because I know artists' labor and time is money, and I get all that. But to have more than fifty percent of a deposit, that is concerning to me. And I was wondering if maybe you might be willing to do like one third and when you're all done and it has to all cure because you had mentioned in here that there's three to four months before you can install that it has to cure once. So if we give you a third deposit and then when you're all done and staff looks at it and says, yes, it's already, it's now in the curing stage, we give you another third. And then when it's all finished and installed and, and erected, and completely done, check, then we give you the final payment. And I Absolutely. was wondering if that would be something a little bit more comforting to taxpayers and also if that would work with you. I think it would. Um, the 60% the deposit is, is standard in my industry. I also don't, my industry is not based around art pieces. If I go to a hotel and do a massive art piece on the back, um, it's no different than me going to that same hotel, Jane, and doing a trade show for them. So um, that's that's kind of a standard on our on our bids and, and that kind of process. Um, progress payments are also fine. I mean, anytime I do a large construction project of any kind, it's all progress payments as well. So, okay. I just wanted to throw that out there and see if you were if that was something you were willing to bend a little Absolutely. bit on. Absolutely. Once we once we no pay that <laughs> once once we bathe that thing in epoxy, it's got to set for exactly. a solid six weeks before you can touch it again. So. Exactly. So thank you. Yep. Anything else, Commissioner? And not at this time. Okay, Commissioner Langdon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I was also concerned about the materials, so I'm glad Commissioner uh, McDowell asked that question. I might have missed it, but what are the dimensions of the piece? The the base of it, I, th I want to say, I don't have the dimensions exactly in front of me. I think we went with a, a roughly six by six aluminum base. And then the bottom of that log, the log is roughly 20 inches in diameter. It's hard for me to give you an exact. But um, the bottom of that log will be essentially curved, for lack of a better term, so that nothing can set under there. It can't, right. it can't hold water in or anything. We're, we're essentially going to build this so that the water will shed away from the sculpture. Um, that's the need for the, the concrete base below it. So it sounds like it would have significant, what I would call thud value. It's going to be a pretty substantial it's yeah, piece. It's, it's going to be a, a pretty intense piece. <clears throat> yeah. And, and just a comment, I'm really pleased with the proposed location. Um, the Mayakahatchee Greenway is such a beautiful trail, and it can be mm. a little difficult to find. So I think having yeah. that piece there on price will be a great way for people to recognize that that's sort of that little trailhead. So I love the location. The piece sounds beautiful. I'm comfortable that it can withstand Florida weather for a good period of time. And it looks gorgeous. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Vice Mayor. Just a comment. It's a beautiful piece. It will look great there. Thank it you. really okay. will. All right. Uh, Commissioner McDowell? Yeah, I have a follow-up question. Could you bring that back up, please? The picture of it? It, it, it is absolutely gorgeous. I, I think it's beautiful. Can you, so the base is six feet by six feet. How tall would you say that base is going to be with the concrete pad and, and the base of your piece? So the, the, if you, you can kind of see in here, we, we um, again, it's hard to convey digitally. Um, mm -hmm. The, the concrete itself will be about four inches. Then we will go ahead and drill anchors into that and we'll use stainless hardware to bolt that thing too. And then it will have, I wanna say it was like an eight inch um, 
aluminum base on it that will essentially be a grid pattern. Like the sculptures over here at the mm -hmm. assisted living place, similar to that, mm -hmm. that build, um, again, to allow water and everything to shed off it, it can't puddle up. How far from the bottom where the log is, the log is sitting on the base, mm -hmm. how far from the bottom up to where that first branch <coughs> or green the green mm -hmm. part would be how how big is that our intention was initially to go kind of low but then we started thinking about we probably wanted above like standard head heights so we don't have kids climbing on it or people trying to vandalize it so i was kind of thinking six or seven feet so you you couldn't climb it i mean you'd have to be pretty pretty proficient at climbing to get up there um now that i'm thinking about it even higher because i can reach eight feet because so, <laughs> um, i can reach out yeah and, and we don't want anybody trying to hang from it or, or do anything to it that's exactly where I was going. I, I was looking at this, and when you mentioned the thug value, I was like, oh, and it's right by the high school, middle school. The, the, the trail is beautiful, but it's also right next to the park. I didn't want this to become the next jungle gym. gym. Right. The initial height <laughs> requirements, I want to say, was like between 10 and 12 feet. That was my maximum because of the, the initial location. I don't, I don't have to conform to that if... if if the new site doesn't doesn't require me to, I can go a little bit higher. I'm mean, gonna move those up a little bit so that they're not accessible. And how tall would you say it's gonna go? From Initially, the base? it was gonna be 12 feet. I was gonna push every inch of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I and I'm sure staff and you will get together and work out all the logistics to keep it safe, so we don't have to put security around it or a mm -hmm. fence around it or it, that's the last thing I want to do I don't want I don't want this to be something that we go oh, why didn't we think of that right. <laughs> so thank you thank you I had, a, I had a question about um well just to clarify you said 12 feet is that from bottom to top or is that once the the green start bottom to top was was 12 feet initially because that was the parameters that we were given um, okay but I had a question uh, about the location of that. I do have concerns about where it is, actually. Um, uh, Commissioner McDowell kind of alluded to it. It really is not in, a, in an area that people go to. And I'm concerned about vandalism there, uh, that it's an easy target for graffiti. I know that's at the end of the trail, but there's no way for anybody to actually view it um, unless they park at Butler and it's not a pedestrian, as you know, friendly way to get from Butler, but Butler Park, the shop, the uh, parking lot, to where that is, because you have to walk over the bridge. Anyway, I, I'm sorry. What, why weren't other places considered for this? Uh, or was this it? Um, I think they considered other places when we first started um, well, that was another project. I was thinking about not Spoonville. Um, this was brought up by um, the public works director as a potential solution because it is close to Heron Creek. Okay, and so part it, of this was it had to be near the contribution from the Heron Creek developer. Okay. So we thought it was a, a natural fit. Okay. All right. Because uh, just for maybe future things, you know, isn't that the, the sidewalk that's along Sumter, isn't that called the Greenways? That's called the Greenways. The little signs that we have out there. There are signs that call yeah. that. Yeah, because there's we have we have gazebos out along there, and I just thought that it's kind of like begging for art or sculpture. And I like to think of public art too as a a, a draw, like a discovery thing. When people drive by and they say, "Hey, look at that! What's that?" and this will entice them to go walk along a walkway. Whereas, like I just said, but. Butler Park, it's awkward to get to that entrance, as opposed to people are parking on Appomattox to use that trail. They're not really parking at the other. And if they do, they have to walk across the bridge, and it's a very narrow. Do you know what I'm talking we about? We understand. Actually, yeah. people are parking at both ends. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's very popular. There are a lot of people right. that are using that trail right now. Yeah. Um, and once um, we get to that uh, widening of Price Boulevard on that project, yeah. Yeah. Um, it could then be actually, an actual sidewalk, because I don't think that's there. a sidewalk on there. That's just kind of like so they can work on the bridge. Type yeah, thing. right yeah. now it is, correct. Right, okay. All right. Um, and is this going to be lit at night or no? Um, we, hadn't, we hadn't talked about that. Um, I don't believe that there is um, 
electric there mm. that we would be able to access. Like solar, maybe? We a lot, a lot of that. places are utilizing yeah. solar We could look at lights. it. Lights, yeah. Okay. All right, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah. What about putting it at the Appomattox entrance instead of the Price Boulevard entrance? Keeping the height higher to prevent Traffic. climbers and <laughs> <laughs> um, but this way it's it's a little bit more noticeable to Mayor's point and it's still near the Heron Creek development. I I, I don't know. We'd have to go back and get approvals. Um, if we were going to change the oh, location. Oh, because we already got it from Mr. York. That's mm -hmm. right. All right. All right. You know what? Maybe this is a good meeting place, and it, it will then draw the attention to this new park, and mm. word's getting out. It's it's very popular. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was just concerned about, you know, vandalism out there. But, okay. And I know I like to put this thing to rest. I know. <laughs> I, that's why I, I stopped with the uh, Appomattox as soon as you said about the approvals. <laughs> I know, it's like, forget it, you lost me. Um, I can miss your line. Just quick, I'm always quick. That's good. Yeah. Just the traffic count on Price, so many more people are going to see it at that mm -hmm. location that's than so on Appomattox. So I think it's, it's a perfect location. Mm -hmm. Vandalism is a concern wherever we put it. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. All right. You're good. All right. Uh, do we have any public comment? We, we don't? No. Okay. okay. All right. So then I'm looking for a motion. I'll okay. do it. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Langdon. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to direct city manager to move forward with the installation of the artwork as presented by Mike Halligan to be located near the Myakahachi Creek Greenway Trail along Price Boulevard in an amount not to exceed $45,000. A second for discussion. All right, we have a motion made by Commissioner Langdon to direct the city manager to move forward with the installation of the artwork as presented by Mike Halligan to be located near the Myakahachi Creek Greenway Trail along Price Boulevard in an amount not to exceed $45,000. Dollars and that was seconded by Commissioner McDowell. And Commissioner McDowell, did you? Have yeah, my first question had to do with: um, Do we need to give direction to take the money out of Art Fund, or is that understood? And or do we need to give that direction also? No, that's that's part of the financial impact, and we would come back um, and uh, do that as a budget amendment. Okay. So I think then my next question goes back to the artist. Would you be willing to do a thirty-three, a third, a third, a third, um, for payment instead of the sixty forty? Yes, we can bring okay. it in three. I'd like to make an amendment. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to make an amendment to change the deposit amount and um, payment in one third intervals, um, starting with the de initial deposit. And then another third at the time of completion during the curing process. And then the final third at the um, installation completion. All right. We have a motion made by Commissioner McDowell. I'm going to ask amendment. The city, uh, an amendment. Amendment uh, made by Commissioner McDowell. I'm going to ask the city clerk to read that back because you were very specific about yep. what you wanted to do there. To change the deposit. Deposit and payment to be in one third increments of an initial deposit, one third during completion and curing process, and another one third at the final installation. All right, do I have a second for that? Yeah, I'll second it. Okay. Seconded by Vice Mayor. If there's nothing on the discussion, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's vote on the amendment. And that passes three to one with Commissioner Langdon dissenting. Do you want to comment? Um, yes, I do. I thought the original payment um, situation was acceptable, so I didn't see any reason to change it. 
All right. Thank you. So let's vote on the original motion. Okay. As amended. And that passes four to one. Thank, so thank you. you so much. I'm sorry. I just heard what I said. That passes four to zero. <laughs> I thought you said one. In the yes, I did. I know, I did. I said, wait a minute. Maybe I should have had a cup of coffee and burn out a break there. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, let's move on to item B. A discussion and possible action regarding approval of the March 5th, 2024 commission regular meeting minutes. Uh, City Clerk, this is your item. The draft minutes were submitted to commission for review on March 7th, 2024, and Commissioner McDowell provided suggested changes on March 5th, 2024. Those changes were taken into consideration and made and are in the um, minutes that have been provided for approval. Okay. Do we have any questions? Do we have any public comment? So I'm looking for a motion. I'll make it. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Move to approve the March 5th, 2024 meeting minutes as presented with the recommended changes. Okay, we have a motion to approve those March 5th, 2024 meeting minutes as presented with the recommended changes made by Vice Mayor Stokes. I'm looking for a second. Second. Seconded by Commissioner McDowell. Mm -hmm. If there's nothing else, let's vote. And that passes four to zero. All right, moving on to item C. 24-0490. Uh, City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This item is discussion of possible action regarding a potential referendum for charter amendment regarding the city's bonding authority, a potential referendum authorizing bonds and other funding option for the police department headquarters project. Um, you will notice that we attach the bond language that we have captured from our co previous conversations uh, attached to the item, which outlines our current proposal of up to $50 million in surtax maturing, as well as $35 million paid from at the loan property taxes. We do want to get your feedback on that this evening, as well as there were a few motions that were given to us on March the 7th, and one was to direct us to proceed with the $122 million growth to 2065 plan. Um, for that model, we are still at the what we propose to be $100 million, and as I labeled in my memo, we would have to in increase the amount of the um, voter referendum from 35 to 57, if that's the case. You also directed us to work with the engineer um, firm for site drainage and construction plans 100%, including um, identifying a funding plan for the $4 million not to exceed for the balance to get us to that 100%. And as we stated in the memo, we believe that that would have to come from fund balance at this time. You also uh, directed us to schedule a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce, and that meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, April the 2nd. And you also directed um, us to work on alternative options of a lease buyback for construction of the headquarters as well. And the attorney's office put together a great table that outlined uh, information that she has received and compiled. So today, this evening, we really wanted to get your feedback on the bond referendum draft language because it does have deadlines. We want to make sure that the language is correct, even if you change the numbers as we get to further information. Following today's conversation, you will have a meeting on April the 1st that will go over the surtax list and the CIP list, see if there are any changes that you would like to influence your decision making, as well as um, you will not make a decision until you meet with the Chamber of Commerce, who we have stated and will restate is a valuable partner of ours, and we would like to hear them and talk to them and have a conversation before you make um, your final decision as we move forward. So I'll stop right there, Madam Mayor, and see how you would like to proceed. But that was the gist of the agenda. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Um, Vice Mayor. 
Um, I had a couple of questions on what in 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 the in in the present um, referendum language we're looking at fifty million of surtax and thirty five of millage to get to the eight to get to eighty five. We talked about how we, we theoretically get from eighty five up to. 100, 122 million. How, what was the, the criteria used to determine like what the bond, what the rate would be? In other words, like what we would pay on this debt obligation, both the 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 um, the uh, surtax portion and and the millage rate portion for for because these are I, I gather two different bonds that would be packaged as as one referendum item. The finance director is on the way. Good evening, Kim Williams, finance director. Um, so for determining the rate, obviously we don't know what the market's going to be doing when we go out, but we reached out to our financial advisors, which are PFM. And that we they suggested that we use six percent for our calculations. These are all just estimates. It won't be final until we actually get to the point that we go out to market to issue the bonds. We'll look for the best rate, whether it's bonds, a bank loan, the the best deal that we can get for the city at that time. And, and are that's I mean, are they underwriters? Do they do they actually are they in the market? <clears throat> I, I mean, only because. You know, I question when you actually put a bond offering together. I mean, very often you find that, you know, those numbers, if it's a, a general obligation bond, it's it's a point to two points less than a than a revenue bond. So I get I guess my question is how how really refined is this? And, and the reason I ask it is we're looking at presently 50 million well a bond a, two bonds. One that would be funded from 50 million in surtax, the other to be funded 35 million from a millage rate increase that the voters would be asked to vote on. <clears throat> and my concern, and it's been all along, is that um, the utilization of surtax provides a much broader base of parties who contribute to the to the payment of this safety building okay um not only do we have property owners but we have renters we have tourists we have snowbirds we have people who shop all over the county <coughs> who may not even come to northport but because we get a prorated share of the county surtax and we are the fastest growing we get based on population other than the school board, the greatest share. And my concern's been that, you know, the, this police headquarters is, I believe, a necessity. And it is a need, it is not a want. And I believe that the possibility exists with a deep dive into the surtax. So far, that 50 million was Price Boulevard widening two. Phase one is moving along. Phase two is a need, but may not have the highest level of priority equal to a police headquarters that provides safety to our citizens. But there are a plethora of projects in surtax. And to, to, to take the approach of asking our citizens to vote themselves a property tax increase, I would love to see us try to finance the vast majority, if not all, of this project out of surtax, grant monies, impact fees granted there, as we talked last meeting, almost non-existent now, but and the general fund could grow over the years. And if this were to be spread, over a period of years where surtax was the primary funding of this, we would allow our city to grow both 
property owners residentially as well as commercially. So if the need arose down the line to look at the potential of millage increases to pay for some of this, we would have a broader base to draw from. And I guess what I'm saying is that to sit here and say 50 million is coming from surtax, price widening too, and 35 coming from a millage rate increase, and, and quite frankly, that's only 85. I mean, to get that number to where we need it to be, we're not looking at 35. We're looking at another 10 or $20 million, which is, in my estimation, asking citizens to vote for over a 10% increase. And I say, why would we ask them to do it if we could fund this through wants in the surtax pile? So I would love, before we even look at the language for this referendum, I would love to do a deep dive into every single surtax project and look to see, could we get that number to 70, 80 million? Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. And we are having that conversation on April the 1st. And that's when you will have the entire list. We as a staff could not take the liberty of removing any projects. That is something we could not do. And we've um, rearranged one major project at the end, and we're still having conversations about that as well. I would just say, as someone who has been here for two and a half years, and I've seen this list sort of evolve over that time, there are a lot of departments, staff, commissioners, and citizens who are connected to a lot of these projects that have been already shifted. And when we do ship something for the police headquarters, which I think everyone knows where I stand on that, there are unintended consequences of moving the items around. So we plan on having a very delicate conversation on Monday to allow you to hear from you know, everyone involved to get to the goal of reducing the burden on the taxpayers as much as possible. I appreciate that. Uh, again, I, you know, ask the average citizen, in my opinion, whether or not they want to vote themselves a property tax increase or put a hold on wanted surtax projects. I think that the answer would stand for itself. And, and the idea here is to get a police headquarters built because it is a need and it's a righteous ask. So. Again, I don't know how we talk. I, I know I went into that Monday meeting, that 1st of April meeting, because we're sitting here and, and you would like us to talk about this referendum language, and it, it, it doesn't have any applicability to where I think we're going to end up or I hope we're going to end up. Well, and Mr. Vice Mayor, so this was the direction we were given prior. So we're trying to update you in real time so that you will see that Unless there's a glaring um, objection to this language, if you settle on numbers that go down this pathway, this is what it will look like. You can change the numbers to however you decide, but this, the language and its um, agreement is not something that should wait till later in the process because it is something driven by a timeline that has to be submitted. So you, I, I would not ask you to say, yes, this is the exact language because we've decided on 50 million and 35 million tonight, but the numbers being um, variable, we hope that you agree with the language and the way that it reads. Again, not to be, what if we decide a lease purchase is the right way to go? Yep. Then that referendum language is useless. Then we will change it, but as of today, you decided that you want it to go right. this way. All right, and we, I, we'll, I, we'll I change it. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, uh, for me, I am not comfortable talking about referendum language until we have everything ironed out. I, I'm just not comfortable with it because I think it's sending a message to the citizens who ultimately have to approve this, that this is what we would approve only to change our mind later. It, it makes us look foolish. If we change the numbers or we change which bond it's gonna be or if we're gonna go with a lease thing, I would be much more amenable to discussing the referendum language after we figure out how we're going to finance this. Um, we have four months to get the bond referendum language to the supervisor of elections. And I know four months may not seem like a long time, but 
It's not something we have to do tonight either. Um, the language, I do have some questions about the language. I don't know if now would be appropriate. I, I just don't feel comfortable with this pathway. Um, with the millage rate and the surtax, we haven't talked to our partner yet. That's after the fact on Tuesday. We can wait another couple weeks for this discussion, in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of other things that we need to focus on, and right now, this this can wait. And I I will yield only to hear the thoughts from my fellow commissioners about the referendum language itself. All right, Commissioner Langdon. Um, thank you, Mayor. I am never one to wait on something <laughs> um, that should be done today. However, um, I want to make sure we structure this thing, that whether it's a bond issuance. There are so many different ways to structure a bond issuance, and they all have a direct impact on debt service, um, different ways of structuring the payments. Um, they can be even throughout the, the life of the issuance, or it can vary less now, more later, more now, less later, all have strategic implications. And, and I just don't feel that we as um, a team have really looked at all the different ways we can do this and, and what the impact might be. Um, because again, I think it's important that we minimize debt service. And if we can minimize or even eliminate the need to rely on a millage rate increase, then I, I want to take a look at those options. Um, I just don't feel we've, we've really looked at or discussed as a team a lease purchase. Again, there are different ways of doing that that have implications on debt service cost and, and that kind of thing. So um, I really feel that looking at the language of this referendum question is premature. I agree with my fellow commissioners on that. Um, and we do have a workshop coming up that might provide us with an opportunity to look at that. Um, city attorney did a great job of sort of analyzing which options are possible and um, what some of the issues might be with them. But, but obviously, she didn't include a financial impact. That's not her role. So uh, I'm just feeling that looking at referendum language tonight is premature. Um, and, and I'd like to wait until we can have deeper discussions on options. OK. Um, Mr. Stokes. Yeah. Um, you know, I sort of echo Commissioner uh, Langdon's position in to, and, and, and Commissioner McDowell's. We need to, to me, f focus on the structure of the funding options. You know, how do we do this? It, it is, is the best thing to do uh, uh, two bonds in a referendum as envisioned the 1535? Would it be better to do a general obligation bond for 85 million or 100 million? Would it be better to do a lease purchase it's like just recently, um, the county just did a new medical examiner's building. They did it with a lease to purchase. It has to go, in our case, would go to referendum. Public would have to vote on it, so there's no problem there. But at the same time, um, it's the structure of how to do this that's important. When we talk about our outside advisors, financial advisors, does that mean, is that our bond council? It, are that are they underwriters? I mean, there are professionals, third-party professionals who are experts at structuring debt instruments like this. 
and giving advice as to how to best get this project done. I feel like we're putting a little cart before the horse and, 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 and I know that there's this August deadline, but quite frankly, we need to get this right. It's a huge Whoa. ask. And if there's any way humanly possible to do this without asking people to give themselves a property tax increase, then by God, we should find a way to do it. And we don't have, in my opinion, this commission doesn't have the expertise to do it. And I'm not sure whether we've garnered those resources. So, you know, again, I just feel like I don't know where to go with this thing. I mean, what, you know. Okay, the city manager, did you want to? Yeah, just for a little bit of history, we did this because we've already had prior conversations about the bond language. Mm -hmm. If we were to wait and not bring you anything, you would say, well, we didn't like this. Why wouldn't you show us earlier? When you talk about going out to get the answer of how to get it bonded and the different ways of getting it bonded, the first question they're going to ask is, how much do you want to borrow? What's the answer to that question? We don't know that yet. So we're trying to just give you information as you go along, knowing that you don't have all the information to make your final decision, so we can keep you in the loop of things that you've told us to go do and we bring it back to you. Thank we, you. We, I don't mean to, excuse me, I didn't mean that. Oh, we, we're not trying to put you in a position of making a decision, but in the absence of information, it may look like, well, what happened to the bond language that we talked about two months ago? Knowing that it takes legal and finance and outside support in order to make sure that that question meets the needs of this commission in order to be put into a public um, setting. It says draft referendum at the top of it. I'm not asking anyone here to commit to it, but it is a part of the process. It is a pathway that we have prior discussed and it may be chosen. I don't think beating us up over bringing you the question is gonna help us get to the answer that we're all trying to get to. Yeah, and, and, and I don't view it as, as beating up on anything. I, I see it as we did give direction for a $122 million mm -hmm. police headquarters. 50 and 35 is 85. And if we need $122 million to do this, or a little less than that, because certain funds will be advanced in other ways, then we need to look at how are we going to pay for this thing? And if I don't see how $85 million is a sufficient bond level, maybe we should start there. If Unless we want to change the scope of the project, but we, we did give direction to make it a $122 million project. I, I don't want to second guess the subject matter experts who said this is what our police need. So if that's a given, then we're not asking for enough. We need a $100 million bond, or we need a lease purchase that's going to be able to be paid over 40 years to amortize it. And that, to me, is the subject to be discussed. Without that, we're, we're, we're just spinning wheels. I, I'm good with I don't care what language we use for a bond referendum, but if it's not the bond referendum we're going to do, why even spend time talking about it? We really need to answer that question. We're, we're in, in the information staff supplied us just yesterday, it indicated that if we needed to go beyond 85 million, it would require taking that 35 million of millage rate up higher. Well, what does that look like? And, and is that something that's even realistic or palatable? To have to go to referendum and have the citizens vote this down and delay another year, two, three, four is going to make this $122 million police headquarters 150, 170. It, there's got to me. All we should be talking about is how we do this. And, and we're not. We're not. We don't have, where's the bond council here? Where are it. the experts? And, and I'm sorry. I don't mean to be so outrageous here, but, but time's a waste, <coughs> as you say. And we're not focused on what's important, in my opinion, which is how the heck do we get to $122 million? What's the best way to do it? And, and that's what I'd like to hear everybody talking about. Commissioner Sal. Yeah. Um, by no means am I 
chastising you bringing the language right. because that's what we asked you to do. But things have changed since we, we made that ask. We've had a few other conversations. We had a town hall, and I have to tell you, the town hall, even though I was not in attendance, was extremely beneficial. I got to hear from the citizens, and I got to hear staff's answers. And I, when I heard staff's answers, I went, wait a minute, where did that come from? We didn't even talk about that. And it just shows how fluid everything is from day to day, week to week. I agree. We have to iron out how are we going to pay for this? How much of the bond? What kind of bond? We already gave direction for the 122 building. I made that motion. And after I made that motion, I, I was pleased to make that motion and get the support from my fellow commissioners. But afterwards, I went, Deb, of all people, you made a motion to do something and you don't know how you're paying for it. I was kicking myself. I was beating myself up for, for four days over that. We got to figure out how we're going to pay for it. Because at the end of the day, if we don't get our messaging straight and we don't get that answer like that, those citizens are not going to vote for this. And that is what we have to focus on. What are we going to do to get the citizens and the voters to say yes to that bond referendum? And, and I really think focusing on the Financial part of it is what our biggest next step needs to be sooner rather than later. And if that means we have to schedule a, a special meeting every 10 days to get caught up to speed so the citizens are caught up to speed and we're fully transparent and they know what's going on, they know that this is fluid, then that's what we have to do. Get the bond council in here. Get the PFM people in here so that we can ask them these questions, so they can give us a presentation, so they can explain it to us, which ultimately explains it to the citizens. Okay, Commissioner Langdon. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and again, I, I have to react. I'm not beating anyone up. Mm -hmm. I have enormous respect for staff and the difficulty of this task. And I know you <clears throat> gave us exactly what we asked for at the last meeting, but this is a huge project and the dollars are huge and it has far reaching impact um, on our taxpayers. And so I need to make sure and I want the community to know that we have explored every single option for how we structure this thing before we ask them for a millage rate increase. Um, I, I think we owe it to our taxpayers to do that. Um, and after we gave that direction, I wasn't comfortable. I'm not a bond expert. I'm not a financial wizard, but you know, I, I did some additional homework and I, I learned a little bit more, not that I really grasped everything I was reading, but what I took away from that is there are a lot of different ways to skim this cat and it has direct implications on the overall cost of the project um, and, and what we need to ask for and how we need to structure it. Um, and yeah, I, I do think we need to look at our capital project list, and, and we haven't had an opportunity to do that, that yet. I know staff took a first stab. I've, I've gone through and I identified some other things that I would put in the want category rather than the need category. Um, so I just, I think it was unfair of us to ask staff to come back with language, and I apologize for that, um, but we need to do the work before we can put that statement together. Okay. That's it. All right, uh, just some comments from me and a question. Um, we talk about uh, the millage rate increase uh, as if it would be a, you know, a whole lot of money. I think init our initial conversations were based on a $100,000 taxable assessment. That's not market value or what your house is, is worth. I think I have this right, it would be $26 a year. So um, it, that's, I don't want getting out there like the ad valorem increase millage rate, millage rate increase would be like the end of the world, all right? That's, that's really a, 
uh, a, to me, a manageable amount of, of money. Um, I, I just also want to caution the, the this commission from waiting too long for things because I'm, I'm thinking about War Middle Springs, how there was a $9 million uh, budget and by the time there was any action taken, it was twice as much money. I don't want to see that happen okay. here, okay? Okay, good. <clears throat> I hear it's not going to happen. I had a, a question about uh, bonding. We had we voted for a road bond some years ago, and for people who don't know that, if it's on your tax statement, it's $46 uh, for a road uh, bond because we had to fix all the roads in the in the city. And the people approved that. That's why you have such nice roads in the city. Um, but that's on every single lot, not just um, those who have a house on it. It's every single lot is assessed $46. I, I was just had a question, could that be the same situation here? Because if we're talking about ad valorem, it would only be for those who have a house. Um, where, uh, because it would be on, well, no, let me put it this way. Yes, but the biggest impact would be for those who have a house on it, let me put it that way, because undeveloped land wouldn't be have as much of a taxable value as, as a house. So I was just curious if that could be done the same way. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody and they asked that question. So I thought I'll bring it up and just see if that could be thrown out there. Mayor, that is that is not available here. And okay. it's, it's referenced, I know, albeit briefly in my summary chart, that would be a special assessment. Um, and a special assessment has to inure a specific benefit to the property paying the assessment. Case law has examined general government buildings and even police buildings and determined that that provides an equal benefit to everyone in the public and right. not a special benefit to the property. Therefore, a special assessment is not available legally. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. All right, I knew you'd give me an answer for that one. All right, that's great. Um, but I do, I do. there is a need to, to do this. Uh, this building was um, done with a bond and I remember that and I still remember the numbers. You know, only 1,200 people voted the bond for this building and the police building. 1,200 people, that was it. It was a, a special election in August. Um, well, no, I mean, 1,200 people voted, 800 voted yes. Okay, we didn't even get everybody to vote for this building. But if those 800 people hadn't approved this, we wouldn't be sitting in this nice building here and the police wouldn't have had their nice building. You would be having these meetings still out there on Northport Boulevard. Uh, and some of us remember those buildings and going to City Hall there. Uh, so this is definitely something that's needed. I want to, I want to see it done. Um, it's, it's necessary. We are a growing city and we're only 30% built out. And their police department is, is bursting at the seams. So however this has to get done, I, I want to see it done. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. Vice Mayor. Yes. You know, in, in response to, to the mayor's comment about the amount of, of property tax increase that would be involved here, you know, uh, the reality is, even if it were a couple of hundred dollars for the year, or a, a, a segment of our citizenry probably wouldn't break the bank, but that's not the issue, in my opinion. The issue is that Property owners under this present approach of combination of surtax and millage rate to pay puts a property owner in the position of having to pay twice. We all pay into the surtax through consumption when we pay our sales tax on everything we, we purchase. And then again, we're now asking property owners to pay again. And we all, all of us, reap the benefit of a safe city. We're all beneficiaries of that. And I just believe in all my heart that this project should be paid with surtax, which is payable by everyone who benefits from the safety in this city. And it shouldn't be unfairly borne by our property owners. And everything and anything we could do 
to either eliminate the need or postpone the need and get it out there. If we could get eight, 10 years out of surtax funds and not have to look at property tax increases until well into eight, 10, 12 years from now, if that's possible, we have a broader base of citizenry, both residentially and commercially, to help absorb that so it wouldn't be that big. And that's why the structure of this transaction needs to be one in which the city leadership <clears throat> has the ability to pull from a variety of funding sources, starting with millage, building grant monies, building impact fees, and as a last possible resort, looking to general fund, which is primarily property taxes. I think we owe that to our citizens. This is the ultimate need. Nobody doubts that safety is the most important thing that we provide our citizens. And no one should want to second guess to subject matter professionals who have said, this is the project we need. This is the size of the project we need. But how we pay for it should be borne by everyone who benefits. And that's all I'm saying. And I don't believe we have really attacked every ability to look. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, I look at that surtax list and you can not touch police, not touch fire, not touch public works, infrastructure, and yet I can come up with $80 million worth of surtax money. If I can do it, and, and again, it's subjective, but I think every one of us needs to do that, and that's what the meeting <clears throat> on, on the first is all about, and that's the next spot to st start, if you ask me. You know, um, unless somebody's got a better way, we could talk about structure, lease versus bonding, I mean, but who's here to advise us on that? Which is better to do? Why wouldn't we just lease this thing? Lease to purchase. So much better in so many ways, unless there's some subject matter experts out there who could speak to us and tell us why that's a lousy idea. Okay. Um, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add is getting back to this referendum language, because that's what we're that's what to we're be talking to be about. Yeah. Um, we need to postpone this discussion till after we have the workshop on the first, after we hear from our um, partners with the chamber on the second. Um, get, get a meeting with the subject matter experts that staff relies on to give them advice. We need to ask them our questions. We need the citizens to be able to hear from those subject matter experts. We can schedule those meetings soon and, and have a special meeting and get those answers so that we can then move forward with what the real plan is. To me, the millage rate, that's a, increasing the millage rate been there, done that in 2019. Please, you do not want to experience that. And, and, and that was just for a general millage rate increase. That wasn't something special for, for the police department. Um, that is a last resort, is increasing the millage rate in my book. We have a duty to make sure we're exploring every option available and we're just not there yet. So I, 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 if you're looking for a motion, Mayor, I. Well, we have to do um, public, public comment. comment. Thank okay. you. So public comment. Jill Luke, I am a, I am opposed to the drafting of a referendum at this point in time for the funding of a potential police department for a few reasons. First, the topic is not fully vetted with all potential funding sources being laid out on the table. Second, this question holds two questions within it, not one. That is viewed as confusing, generally. Third, the money being addressed from surtax does not spell out the projects that would have the money removed from. Price Boulevard Phase 2 does not hold $50 million in it, so other projects would be affected too. If surtax is brought to the citizens in a list of potential projects for their approval, 
The opposite needs to occur in a situation such as this. The citizens have the right to know which projects they would be approving to be removed. Fourth, I don't know as the question going on the ballot in August is even legal. The state has made ballot questions outside of November elections void as they tend to avoid the full voting public. The school board had to face this with their March questions. I'll add, it's not time. This will have to be addressed when all avenues have been vetted and not before. The, the last couple of years has seen a lot of change in added expenses to the budget voiced as not kicking the can down the road. There are times when slowing down to avoid hardship is, in, is the wisest thing to do. Thank you. In person, we have Joe Pozzola, followed by Mick McHale. Do you, do you want them over there? Down over here. Thank you very much, folks, for having me here. I appreciate it. I understand what you're all saying. None of us here want to have seat tax increases. That's a normal thing for anybody to say. But in reference to the police department, if you look out and want to buy or purchase land and put a, uh, let's say, a water facility up, some people use it. A dog park, some people use it. A police department, we all use it. We all need it. Uh, I'm, I, again, I'm not in favor of a tax increase, but we have to look at our uh, officers. We have to look at the size of our city that's growing in leaps and bounds. You got to come up with a way to pay for this in some way to help us citizens, to keep us safe, which all of these police officers and yourselves are doing. I commend you on that. Uh, again, Keep the taxes down if you can. But remember our police officers. We need them. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, Commission, Council, appreciate the opportunity. I had much more to say this evening if you would have moved forward. For, but the indication is we're probably not gonna have that discussion tonight. But what I would ask you, I would ask you is keep in mind how we come about funding this necessity is important to all of us. Just north of us, the city of Sarasota entered into a, a similar dilemma many years ago. I worked there. I could tell you personally, the day we cut the ribbon, the day we cut the ribbon for the brand new state-of-the-art police department, we outgrown it. The day we cut the ribbon. So what I would ask is that you take into consideration the expertise. I'm happy to hear that you want to listen to the subject matter experts as to how we move forward. I am uh, I'm glad to hear that. I am a 30-year citizen of the city of Northport. I raised my family here. I continue to live here. And we, we have to be realistic about the, the, the uh, challenges we face. We advertise internationally. Internationally, we advertise, come here. We're safe. Come live here. Invest in your future here. Not just for retirees, for the, for the active families, for the upcoming families, for those planning a family. So I would ask, obviously it's not moving forward this evening. I would ask that when you do get into the decision-making period, that you take the recommendation for the largest size that we possibly could build. You know, it's interesting, three minutes for 30 years. That's 10 years for a minute. But I'll be back. I, I assure you that I'll be back. And most importantly, what we need to today, almost everybody, is mesmerized by police shows, crime drama. How many murders, how many tr 
tragedies are being solved today because of the technology and most important, the ability of law enforcement departments to preserve that evidence. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I will be back to support that we maximize our ability when the time comes. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Brenda Farley, followed by Karen, Arl Karen Arlington and Vanessa Carazon. I'm Brenda Farley and a full-time disabled senior citizen of Northport. All of our residents have an invested interest and responsibility for our community, not only for present day, but for the future, for ourselves, our family, and our friends. We've paid nearly a million dollars, to my knowledge, for firms, contractors, consultants, architectures to evaluate the Northport Police Department and it recommended the best options and cost effectiveness to bring its present day condition and outgrowth to a level where history won't repeat itself again. Why are residents so against the recommendations? They're going by what they read solely in the newspapers, by hearsay, by their own interpretation of the words being used. Please think of the long-term value of what the North Port Police Department is requesting. Inflation will only continue to increase, and the cost of today's <coughs> prices to the city would be locked in. This is a money saver to do now than to revisit this outgrowth in a few years and the cost then. Don't let history repeat itself by scaling back. Current residents need to vote approval for this request, and I hope I inspire them to do so. It takes courage to go forward, and let's show we have the strength to do just that as a community. Remember, our non informed taxes include the fire and rescue and road and drainage, solid waste, stormwater utility. We have little to no say about that. However, Northport is like the biggest growing city. We're advertising it in Florida. And with this, we need to keep it at the highest current level of law enforcement, safety, and crime prevention, which we all depend on. We receive it, and we expect <coughs> it. And with that, thank you. I will always be there to support our police department. We need them. And without them, our city would fall apart. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I think all of you know who I am, and I've been in this city 38 years, so I've seen quite a bit. First of all, I feel, and I've always said it, we have the best police department I have ever seen anywhere. Our, cap, our chief now, in all the years I've been here, except for maybe the first two or three, is the best chief we have had, ever. I've not been pleased with some of them, but he's been doing a great job. I'm happy that you all agree that we need this police station. We absolutely need it, and they deserve to have it with the work that they've been doing for us. I noticed, I used to come here all the time to all these meetings, and unfortunately life has moved me away, so I can't, not move me away from the city, but move me away so I can't get here. I come in here and I find, you guys are pretty safe. I had to walk through a, a safety thing. I had to put my purse out. You guys are perfectly safe. I feel that the rest of us are that safe in the city. I can walk at night and I don't worry about it. I can put things out in my yard at night, I don't worry about it. I know if I call these gentlemen, they'll be there in a second. They need this stuff. Bottom line, we need it. Find a way. Look at, we're all, my husband and I live on social security. But if they have to raise the tax a little 
so that my home is safer, so this city is safer, and so they, we keep this police department that services us so well, and they have everything they need to do it, then I'm willing to scrape up the difference in my tax money if that's what I have to do. My belief has always been, when you're dishing out money in the city, your priorities are the police department, the fire department, and the schools. That's our safety and our future. And that's where you spend your money. I don't know how you get it, but get it. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how you follow her, man. <laughs> She's got way more energy than me at this time of night. I'm so glad it's you and not me. Can I just say that? No, we've got way no, later than this. This is nonsense. <laughs> um, I am Vanessa Carasone. I have been here forever. And I hope that you all enjoyed my comments at the town hall meeting, my little history um, lesson. Uh, those of you that didn't hear it, you can hear how we kind of got here. But uh, as the city manager said, we don't want to look at the past. I am so glad to hear that there is a unanimous support of building this new building. That's what I hear. Everybody else may hear things negative, but that's what I hear. What I hear is that it's a question of how we get there. So I jotted a few things down. First and foremost, I would hire an auditor. I would get an auditor to come out because finance department is up to their guilds in the new budget and have them review several of the funds. For instance, using the half cent sales tax, the surtax, the public service fee, the interest that's gained off of all of these little fund balances and all of these other projects that are being held in bank accounts, interest is being earned off of that. How much is that? Uh, economic stability fund, the contingency funds that are on projects that have not been used that will go back into the general fund or they'll go back in a surtax, but then can be shifted. Um, the, uh, there's a few other uh, taxes that could be analyzed and utilized, and then you take that all together and you've got your number. All right, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, you can also go back and reduce the fund balance policy. Those limits are at 20%. It is not necessary to be 20%, by the way. 18, 15 to 18% would work. You take whatever that 2% is and you utilize the rest of that money and fund balance that it's gonna save you to go towards this. Um, the vote, by the way, you can do this in a special election, supposedly. Uh, and if that's the case, then you need your language put together in September, October. That way you can get it to the supervisor of election in November and that should give you plenty of time. But if you have to have language now, make it very basic, make it very general that says that the balance of 122 million um, that would be utilized from and then using all those different tax funds. I don't know if you can do that legally. That's why we hire the big guns. Number one, one thing, if you don't do anything tonight, please, Vote on the design. Vote for the design, full funding, 100% at a fund balance, get it done, get it done tonight, because it's gonna take three to four years to actually get this accomplished. By that time, we will be behind the eight ball. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's all, okay. All right, so uh, where are we? Does anybody want to? Yeah, I do. Give direction, make a motion, okay? Yeah. It's Commissioner Carasone brought up a point that I apologize for not. I added in my notes. And if there is one thing that we should approach tonight or at least have a good, healthy discussion on is the design aspects of this. I mean. It's not on the agenda. Not on the agenda. No, can't, so we it's can't not on the agenda. It's only what, what we, what's on here. Well, that's true. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner uh, Vice Mayor, can I, can I try a first motion? Absolutely. 
It's, it's very basic. Um, we have a workshop scheduled for Monday the 1st. Um, I'd like, and we can change this. Um, I'd like to see about changing it to a special meeting. That way, then motions can be made instead of just consensus. I, I really think we, we've got a lot of decisions that need to be made, and they're time sensitive, and conversations spark motions. And I really think that Monday's workshop should be a special meeting. So if I can make a motion to change Monday's meeting from a workshop to a special meeting. I'd second that. Okay, I have a motion on the floor by Commissioner McDowell to change the April 1st scheduled workshop to a special meeting. I have some comments. Uh, and that was seconded by Vice Mayor. Yes. We can discuss now, though, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, we've talked a lot about needing a more complete analysis of different bond structures versus different ways of doing lease to own. I just don't think there's enough time between now and Monday to do that. Um, so I wouldn't be in support of that motion. Um, I, I'm more, I, I'd like to instruct a city manager to work with staff to identify the requisite experts who can do that analysis and, and bring it back to us. Um, I, d I don't think it should have to take a month to do that. Um, but I, I just don't think I would be any more equipped on Monday to make decisions about this than I would tonight. Matt? Yeah. It's my understanding Monday's workshop is to move around CIP projects right. and, and surtax projects. While I would not be in favor of moving surtax projects until after we have the discussion with the chamber, I would be in favor of possibly changing around some CIP projects. And to your point, Commissioner Langdon, absolutely, we're not ready for other people to come in and help us with the bonding things that were brought up today on Monday. We know that's in the future, but I'm just talking about Monday's commission workshop to be a meeting so that way then we can give some general direction so they can start with that piece of that puzzle and also potentially give direction on how to fund the 100% design plans that we already gave motion, uh, made a motion and approval for. That's all I was looking for. Um, workshops, workshops are good, but if decisions have to be made, they have to be made then timely, and that cannot happen at a workshop. Okay. I have a question. Sure. What, what are the implications of that in terms of Legal. notification yeah, yeah, and, and that kind of thing? We're are we okay with everything? Agenda hasn't even posted yet. Actually, it's posted, but we may amend it prior to. Okay. Just post it. When did it post? Like it posted between this. our first meeting today and this meeting. Yeah. That's why I sent out the email. <laughs> All right, you can just change it to a special if, meeting. If we vote for that, you can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yeah. yeah but, I mean, the biggest reason, I, I do think that the vast majority of what we'll discuss on the first will be, would lend itself to, to the workshop. But, but I do think we really need to take a hard look at at the, the funding of the um, uh, the design aspects because it's a year out from that. I mean, this is, it's time sensitive. I mean, the, the longer this project gets stretched, one way or the other, I believe we're gonna do this. One way or the other, we'll figure out how to fund it. But the design aspects of this do need to get done. And, and the talk about how that, I believe it was like four million, gets paid out. I don't believe it's all at one time, but we need to have that discussion, be in a position to maybe give direction. Right, that that, that's a, the reason why I hate to, to be an agenda I, I really hate to okay. lose the ability to do that. All right. So, uh, yeah. so the motion is to change it to a special meeting. I'll make another motion to have the agenda amend. I would assume it needs to be amended now to include yeah. the financing for the 100% design plans and funding options. 
So let's take the motion that's on the floor, call the question, and see where it lands. If there's no further okay, discussion. Okay, the motion that you, you presented, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, yes. the motion to change it from a workshop to a special meeting. Okay, and that was made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by, I'm sorry, Vice yeah. Mayor? Vice Mayor. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's vote on that. That passes four to zero. So not knowing what's on the agenda, is there something on the workshop agenda that includes funding options for 100% design plans? Will staff and city manager be prepared by Monday to have that discussion? Because you had mentioned it at the introduction of this that you needed that um, approval, funding approval? Yes, Commissioner. So in our memo that we outlined, we don't have another source to pay for that other than fund balance. So our opinion is not going to change between now and Monday. So at this time, then, we would need to have the agenda amended to include that discussion. Is that what I'm hearing? Is that what you want? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I will make a motion to have city manager or city clerk amend the agenda to include funding discussion on getting the Northport Police headquarters to 100% design plan. I'll second it. All right, we have a motion made by Commissioner McDowell. City clerk, clerk, can you repeat that for clarity? To amend the April 1, 2024 agenda to include funding discussion regarding the Northport Police Department headquarters to 100% design plan. All right, and that was seconded by Vice Mayor. Any further discussion? No. All right, let's vote. And that passes four to zero. All right, I think I'm tapped out if somebody wants to take it over. I'll let somebody else try motions. Or what are we looking for? Vice Mayor? Oh. Well, you wanted to give direction to have the bond council and oh. investors and stuff at a future meeting. For those discussions and we we got to give them direction and yeah. tell them what we want exactly thank you i would like to make a motion to request city manager to have his staff have a meeting with on council outside financial outside, whatever subject matter professionals staff deems necessary in order to allow us to have a discussion with possible action for how to structure, how to structure the payment of this police headquarters. A second. <clears throat> All right, we have a motion by Vice uh, Mayor Stokes, and that's going to be uh, repeated by the city clerk. Go ahead. To direct the city manager to have staff have a meeting with bond council and or subject matter experts in order to have discussion with. I put PA, I don't want a uh, discussion. Commission. With what? With us. With commission on how to structure <coughs> payment of the police department headquarters. <coughs> that, so, if you want it. Okay. Yeah, that's clear. Close enough. That's okay. Clear. Uh, seconded by Commissioner uh, Langdon. Any, oh, Commissioner McDowell? I just for clarity, when, when you refer to subject matter experts, um, I know city manager refers to his staff as the subject matter experts. Are you also looking to include the financial advisor? Yes. Financial advisor, on council, and any other outside third party experts that could lend assistance with regard to this matter. Yes. Thank you for that clarity. Okay. Anything else? Are we good? All right. Let's vote. And that passes four to zero. All right, anything else on that? 
Do we need to give a motion to table the discussion on the referendum, or is it just going to kind of hang out there? Well, with discussion and possible action, so if we don't, we're not taking action, action. on the referendum. Do we have to do something? Just want to yeah. make sure they bring it back at some point. I'm sure they will. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, any public comment, City Clerk? Oh, okay. But hang on. Oh, we are conversing. Oh, okay. Before you adjourn. Yeah. Well, we have. Your I know it is. I'm sorry. Um, the city attorney was reminding me that I had listed charter amendment in the title of the topic that we were talking about. And that charter amendment was related to the timing of said charter amendment, which is related back to some other decisions that you're going to make as well. So I will bring that conversation back to you when we bring you some information as you get closer to making your decision on how you want to move forward after you talk to the people you just identified you would like to speak to. Sorry. Oh, okay. So, okay, we're okay with that. We can just move on. Right? Yeah. yeah. Just follow up. When, you, when we have this meeting with these outside subject matter experts, is that going to be a meeting here? Or is this going to be a meeting one-on-one -on -one with each one of us commissioners? I was, I was hoping it would be a commission meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I mean basically... You know, the same way we are able to ask questions of staff, I would like to ask questions of bond counsel, outside financial analysts, whoever, to really, you know, pick their brains. We need them to give us advice. We're the ones that have to make this decision. We need to hear it from these people in order to make the most informed decision we can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, did you say there was no further public comment? Okay. Let's move on to commission communications. <coughs> Commissioner McDowell, you're up first. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't even write down what my things were, so I will just have to refer to my calendar to help jog my memory. Yes. Yesterday, I attended my first MPO meeting as, as a, a sitting board member um, after navigating the traffic from yesterday morning's accidents. <laughs> um, made it on time, barely. Um, I have to tell you, the MPO meeting was quite quite interesting. Um, they had a presentation about growth and the county and Manatee County, and it's able to be drilled down by the city, by an area, by a block. It was phenomenal learning how that growth plan looks. And they said that that information is readily available for any municipality to use, uh, any county to use, any <coughs> school board to use, uh, nonprofits to use. That information is readily available. And I sure hope that our staff is, is going to take full advantage of that because uh, there's no sense in reinventing the wheel and paying for services twice when they've already done it and paid for it. <laughs> Uh, it was it was fantastic. Um, I held a town hall at the same time that the city held their town hall. Um, I did not have a very good turnout, and it's okay because I am hopeful that everybody was here instead, and or listening online. Um, the mock commission meeting we all attended. It was fantastic watching the kids be uh, staff and what they had planned and how they presented. They definitely didn't have a fear of speaking, and that is fantastic. I uh, attended the Do the Right Thing event on that last week. Uh, it's always nice to see the kids uh, doing the right thing. Some of their stories are just really uh, hit your heart. Uh, I was also the guest speaker for the John Rawlings show last week. Uh, we, we just touched on like everything and anything. Um, Minnesota League of Cities. I attended that meeting. Um, I am the chair. Uh, it was announced that I also am Home Rule Hero Award again this year. So I was honored to receive that recognition. Um, they will be doing presentation next uh, March. 
So I think that's it for now. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Commissioner Langdon. Yeah, thank you. Um, I did attend the town hall on the new Northport headquarters. I found it very interesting. Um, I was surprised by some of the, the comments. I think that the people who gave public comment here tonight were much more consistent with, I think, the sort of the temperature or attitude of the city as a whole. Um, I also, I really enjoyed that mock commission meeting with the bigs and the littles, and I was very impressed by the presentations. And I, I made the comment then, and I hope it comes true. I really saw some future city planners in that group. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I hope they come here to work. I mean, they were really great. Uh, attended the police swearing in. Um, I I think there were three or four officers from Arcadia. I mean, that just mm -hmm. really um, struck me. I, I'm, I'm sure it's a, ah, this gentleman here. Oh, welcome, welcome to Northport. <laughs> um, it, we just really have to extend Toledo Blade right out to Arcadia, make it much easier for for our men and women in blue to, to uh, get to work. Um, I also attended the county EDC event, the business in the ballpark. I love those. It's always great to get out to cool today. Boy, what an asset that is for the city. Um, I attended the groundbreaking for the Steve and Marjorie Townsend campus at the Gene Matthews Boys and Girls Club. I wanted to make sure I referenced that properly. Wow, it's wonderful to see that project get off the ground. And um, I, I just really admire the folks who stepped up to help fund that. I went to the Business Expo um, here at the Mullen Center um, and the Teen Court Scholarship Dinner. Um, and unfortunately, I was the only one who stood up to applaud the scholarship winner from the city of Northport, but I felt it was well-deserved. So I think that's everything um, that I've done in the past couple of weeks. Do you know what the recipient was? <clears throat> yes, I do. Well, give a shout out. Well, I think I did that already. Well, the name. Wow, it was city manager Fletcher's okay. daughter. <laughs> ah, Congratulations. Yes. You oh, must yes. be proud. We're all very proud. Very proud. Wow, okay. Vice Mayor. Right. Um, all right. Also attended the to do the right thing uh, quarterly honors ceremony. That was great. I love going to those. It's great to see young people lending a helping hand, looking out for for their friends and peers. Um, participated in the uh, in the mock commission meeting um, with Big Brothers and Sisters program. That was a treat. They really, uh, they did real good. Better than we do sometimes. <laughs> um, attended the police swearing in ceremony, which is always an honor. Um, attended uh, Council of Governments with our neighbors, City of Sarasota, uh, County Representatives, uh, Hospital Authority, and Airport Authority. That's something we do on a monthly basis. Uh, you know, usually mayor uh, attends those, but you know, I've had the opportunity, the pleasurable opportunity of filling in once in a while. I uh, also attended today Meals on Wheels Lunch to honor <coughs> uh, the many, many volunteers who are uh, get up every day, go out and feed people in need. Um, they are a great organization, a growing organization in our city. They feed quite a few hundred people uh, every day, and um, they do great work. So it was nice to be there to honor those volunteers. And um, also attended the groundbreaking for the, uh, the new building in the Boys and Girls Club. And that's gonna be a wonderful, wonderful facility when it's finished. So that's it for me, I think. Yep, you good? Okay. I'm good. All right. Um, <clears throat> Yes, the big brother and big sister uh, mock meeting that we had here was interesting because I had read 
a note that somebody had left for me up here a few weeks ago. Uh, it was, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for all you do. Well, that girl was, was there. And uh, I said, OK, now I know who the mystery writer was. Dakota Hines. I told her I'd give her a shout out. Um, I told her to just go on, the, on our website and fast forward all the way to the end. So there you go, Dakota Hines. I said it two times now. All right? So, but she was such a sweet girl. Um, this morning, I had much conversations at the Foxtail Coffee. Is that called a coffee house? I don't even know. Coffee or just Foxtail <coughs> Coffee. Um, in Welland Park, and, and uh, it was great talking to people um, that have just wonderful things to say about Northport, and I just love hearing that. Uh, again, as someone who's been here for 30-something years, and it wasn't always that way. Um, and I hate to say that, but now people are like, you know, it's just so great what's happening here. And also these other things that, that I, uh, I attend. I, I went to the Reading Festival in Venice. That's at Blaylock. Park, which is known as the Monte Andrews Tree Arboretum. But um, again, as soon as I, I tell people I'm from Northport, and uh, I really don't tell people I'm involved with politics, because I like for them to uh, just to give me their honest feedback. And it's like, wow, oh, you know, the great things happening there. We're hearing a lot about Northport, and I just love to, to hear that. Um, yes, I went to the Boys and Girls Club groundbreaking. Uh, and that's, again, what's really interesting is because I remember when that was, um, that building, old building was the uh, Biscayne Church. Yeah, I remember that. Um, I went to the Habitat for Humanity Rocking Around the Clock Sock Hop. Yeah, um, that was really a lot of fun. I actually bought myself like a, a 50s costume. I don't, that's not me, but I did that. <laughs> and uh, just I, rub it off on you. <laughs> Well, speaking of the, the devil, yes, they they said I uh, they said I could have two tickets, and I said I know just the person I'm going to give that other ticket to. Yes, so uh, former commissioner Jill Luke was there and dressed, of course, up. I didn't even recognize her. She had a red red wig. Yeah, and I I walked right by her when I got there because I didn't even know it was her. It's just so funny. Um, uh, probably most of you heard that uh, you Culver House is funding the 211. We had talked about the 211 being defunded by the county commissioners, and he's going to fund that for two years. Uh, you Culver House, for those who don't know, you should Google him. He's a he's a big player in Sarasota County, owned a lot of land, and there's actually along the Legacy Trail, there's a Culver House nature stop or something, and and that's his family um, owned that that land. Uh, there and uh, had to give it up for the railroad. That's how far back they go in the 1920s. So lots of history with his family. So I was really help, uh, really happy to see that. I don't know what's going to happen after two years, but like to see the, the county step up to the plate again and, and fund that for our residents. It's uh, really, really necessary and, and needed. Um, I think that is it for me. Yeah. So. Um, Charter officers, uh, city manager. Uh, nothing, Madam Mayor. Okay, city attorney. Nothing, Mayor. Oh, city clerk. Nothing, Mayor. Boy, okay. Boy, not even, okay. <laughs> so, so it is, ah, oh, 8.59. Ugh. I, hate, I, I hate these odd times. I, you know, I hate to sound like Monk. I don't know if anybody knows that show. <laughs> love that show. Uh, I don't know what it is. Okay, 8.59, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Garbage pile. Okay. Yard waste is a separate pickup. So what happens if I use all my uh, bulk pickups already? Good question. So you can have more, but you just have to pay. It's going to be sixteen fifty a cubic yard, okay. and that's length times width times height divided by 27 is one cubic yard. Any questions, of course, let us know. Give us a call, 941-240-8050.